started. Y'all got here, so I don't want to keep y'all waiting too much longer. Uh, as you know, we've been impacted by the weather because a lot of the participants are part of the weather enterprise, and so they've been doing their jobs all day yesterday and last night and this morning, so several of them have contacted us, and they're either still on the way, which means we'll have some people coming in, um, or they can't come at all, or they're going to connect in through the webinar. So it's um, just a couple of changes like that. But we've got enough um, to, to do what we need to do here today. So I want to go ahead and get started by doing the introductions and letting everybody know who's in the room and, and all that. So let's go around and introduce yourself. I'm going to have the speakers, the researchers, introduce themselves first so you know who they are. And then we'll go around and get you guys all involved. David? Hey, so I'm, I'm David. Uh, this is my, my project, uh, my study. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alabama. I work in the geography department, but I'm a, more of a climatologist by training, more of the physical end of geography. Um, I specialize in extreme events. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at heat waves. Uh, we're going to be looking at heat waves in a very sort of uh, radically different way. Um, but I really want you guys to, to give me a lot of input. I want to talk about this. Um, I don't want it to just be me just lecturing at you, that's, that's not what I want to do. So I'm really excited that you're all here and it's going to be really, really interesting, I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> so hi everybody, I'm Erin Bunting. I am a co-PI with David on this project. Um, I am an assistant professor and director for the Center of Remote Sensing and GIS at Michigan State University. So I escaped the snow to come to tornado-ish weather. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my background, like I said, is in remote sensing and GIS. And I fall into the world of understanding what David's going to take and how it represents on the landscape and how different land use and land cover and, and hydrology are impacted by what he's going to show today. So in the second half of the day is when I'm going to present. And it's going to be a lot about um, the second phase of this project and under and your feedback on that is going to be critical because understanding how we can define vulnerability to heat waves is something we're still trying to to figure out with this project and we want it to have obviously real world implications so um yeah it'll be pretty interactive this afternoon with my session or this once david goes through his part his is interactive too um and feel free to ask me any questions as we go either i'm going to be back in the back while he's presenting or you know during lunch or during my presentation thanks Okay, and if you don't know me, um, I'm Laura Myers. I'm the director here at the Center for Advanced Public Safety. Um, and we do <coughs> software development and social science research on human factors, and that's what this is about. So we are part of David and Aaron's grant. We're the broader impacts part of the grant, and that's what this workshop is. It's bringing together people who deal with whether phenomena like yourselves, and in this particular case, heat waves. And so you've been invited because of your interest and knowledge about how these things affect whatever populations that you work with. It may be the general public, it may be more specific populations, it may be other partners in the weather enterprise. So that's why it's real important to go around the room right now and you guys tell us who you are and what you represent so that we know what we've got in the room as we start our discussion. So I'll let Jake start. Hey everybody, I'm Jake Dury. Um, I'm a trained meteorologist. Um, that's what my background is in, and I'm working here at CAPS on weather research and as a project manager. John, I'm just going to let you hold it. Down. Hello everyone, I'm Chandra Clark. I'm a professor in the um, Journalism and Creative Media Department. And uh, my background is definitely in producing news, but more recently, since 2011, um, my team and I have produ produced and documented um, major weather disasters uh, since April 27, 2011. Um, and uh, right now, we've been working with um, Broadcast Education Association uh, to educate people on the role of broadcasters during disasters. And so, just about any TV station that has been impacted by disasters since 2011, I've probably worked with them. So. Hello everyone, my name is Mary Kaiser. I'm one of the senior meteorologists at the National Weather Service Birmingham office. Hi, I'm Tim Greer. I'm with Alabama Emergency Management Agency. I'm a division coordinator. Um, 
basically our liaison between the local counties and uh, the state down in Clinton. <laughs> Chastin Qualls, one of the associate directors here at CAPS. Zachary Hill, I work with IT here and several other projects. Uh, Blake Newman, I'm um, associate director here at CAPS. Good morning, I'm Luann Friend. I'm an assistant professor at the College of Community Health Science and I've done some research with CAPS with hypertension. That's my interest here today. Good morning, I'm Stephanie O'Neill. I'm a research administrator at the Alabama Water Institute. I am Morgan Berry. I'm one of the meteorologists at the National Weather Service in Mobile. We cover the southwestern portion of the state. I'm Jessica Pino. I'm one of the senior forecasters at the National Weather Service in Tallahassee. So we cover Florida, Georgia, and then southeast Alabama. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Fitzgerald. I'm with Alabama Power Company, uh, Safety and Health Supervisor. My background is in industrial hygiene and occupational safety and health. I'm Diana Dollar. I'm Deputy Director for Tuscaloosa County EA, and my background is also in meteorology. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Susan Jasko. I'm a social scientist here at CAPS. Done a lot of work with some of the folks from uh, the National Weather Service and NOAA as well. My background is in human communication. Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Clark, and I'm an assistant director here at CAPS. <laughs> that's Morgan under the headset back there. She's uh, <coughs> videoing and taking pictures of what we're doing. One of the reasons that um, we're videotaping is to capture all of this and to you know, capture the discussion. And uh, we're also um, taking pictures and doing all of that to really put that into the whole research project. But we're also going to share this, this with the folks who didn't get to be here today. So they'll be able to see what we talked about and give us their feedback. So uh, you want to let these guys introduce themselves on here? Sure. Um, we actually won't be able to hear from them. OK. All right. So you want to tell them who's there? Yeah, so we've got um, a couple of uh, broadcasters that are with us. We have Snakes Meganson. Um, we've got a few more broadcasters that will be joining us. Um, they will be um, commenting and asking questions in the chat, so I'll be relaying those two to everybody else um, as we go through the presentations today. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Um, as you can see with what we ended up with, with the cancellations and the changes and all of that, uh, we still got a good representation of all of the component parts of the weather enterprise. And so I think that'll be very useful in our discussion. So what we're going to do is David's going to start out and he's going to talk about his part of the research project. And he's got a series of questions that we're going to discuss and be real interactive about. So I want you to feel, you know, very comfortable jumping in with this discussion because your perspective is what they need. So we'll get through David's and then we'll switch over to Erin's presentation and she'll do hers and she's got some interactive stuff and we're going to be, there's note paper in front of you to take notes on discussions. You will work in groups at some point in time and it's not going to be ornery groups where we get up and move you around. You're just going to turn around and kind of work with the groupings uh, when we get there so it won't get too uncomfortable. And uh, so we'll, that'll make it move pretty you know, smoothly through the day. Jake and my job is to facilitate the discussion because we're trying to capture your feedback. And so we'll be facilitating that part of the process and listening and capturing what it is that you guys are talking about. You're also going to do a survey at the end and you can stay and do the survey at the end if you want to stay here or we'll send you the link so that you can do it when you get back home. Because I know uh, several of you have long trips when we get done this afternoon. And we will be done by 2 o'clock because I know you got a lot of um, travel ahead of you if you came from a distance. And so you can do the survey um, when you get back home if you like. So that's what the day is. Lunch is going to be provided. It'll be in here between 11 and 11.30. We'll <coughs> slow down a little bit and eat for a few minutes and then get right back at it so that we can keep the discussion flowing. All right, so um, we'll, we'll have a few stragglers come in. As the stragglers come in, uh, we'll stop and introduce them um, and get them settled in. So, but uh, I don't think there'll be too many of those. Uh, I think I got two coming from Jackson that were pretty close, and State EMA won't be here till later in the morning. All right, so yeah. 
what to do with this. I never like wearing these things when I'm giving a lecture because I, I feel like my voice is loud enough, but I'll, uh, I guess I'll put it here. That's, that's probably okay. Um, so thanks again for being here. It's really exciting to, to be doing this with you. Um, this, uh, this project has been going for actually about three, three, four years ago, I initially uh, kind of conceptualized this idea. Um, and I was talking to uh, an epidemiologist uh, called Chris Ebay, uh, who works on um, some of the IPCC reports. She's a very prominent epidemiologist, particularly interested in how uh, health interacts with, with climate, and, and, and particularly in her case, uh, climate change. And um, she asked me a question. I, was, I had her in my office. She was visiting our department. And I was sitting there, and, and she asked, you know, you guys are always telling us that heat waves are becoming more frequent, they're becoming higher in their magnitude, they're lasting for a longer duration, a longer length of time when they do happen. But you never tell us, are they getting bigger right, in terms of their spatial extent? When a heat wave happens, is it covering a larger portion of the land surface, was her question. And so it got me thinking, and I thought, no, we don't really do that. I mean, I spend a lot of my time doing fancy <coughs> statistical modeling of heat waves, and that has to do a lot with looking at station data, or maybe it's a gridded, interpolated surface of data that I'm looking at. I'm looking at fairly long-term record, and I'm using fancy stats to try to predict, okay, how is the frequency, magnitude, and duration, and other parameters changing? And I'm going to show you some of that today. But again, when Chris asked me that question, I thought, well, we don't really know whether they're getting bigger, whether they're getting smaller, whether they are becoming more fragmented across space, and also, if, even if we did know if that was happening, we don't know what is causing that change. And so I began to think, how could we conceptualize heat waves more spatially on the landscape? How could we track that through time? And also, how could we think about what is causing that change in terms of land surface processes, atmospheric processes, and how climate change may be playing into that? And I will be mentioning climate change a couple of times throughout this presentation. I just want to say that I'm entirely apolitical. Uh, I'm not even American, as you can tell by my accent, so I don't, I don't want to get into that at all. Um, this is my opinion uh, based on my research, based on scientific observation. It's not necessarily the opinion of the University of Alabama. I just want to say that. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is really conceptualize heat waves in a very different way. And this grant is very much about trying to track heat waves through time. We're only using observational data at this point. We're not using climate models. We're not trying to look into the future. We're only looking at what we have observed okay, in, the, in the observational record. And in this you know, idea, we're trying to look at how they've changed, why they've changed, and trying to ultimately get at an idea of how can we predict the size and shape and connectivity within a heat wave. And maybe we can do that, perhaps, at a seasonal time step. So that's where I see this research going, is giving you some sort of seasonal forecast to work with, where we look at antecedent soil moisture. We look at what's going on with atmospheric teleconnections. And maybe, in the springtime, we can tell you this summer is going to be bad for heat waves. We might be able to tell you this summer is going to see larger than normal heat waves. We might be able to tell you this summer is going to see more fragmented, less connected heat waves, more sporadic across the landscape. We may be able to answer those sorts of questions and give you some sort of uh, seasonal forecast, like I say, that can tell you something about heat waves and help you prepare for them in the upcoming summertime. So that's really what we're trying to get at. And really, you know, I, I want this to be, like Laura said, I want this to be as interactive as possible. I want to hear from you guys because you guys are the experts in a lot of areas that I know nothing about. I mean, you're expert meteorologists, you're expert forecasters, you're expert um, communicators, right? you're experts in health. I'm not any of those things. I'm just a climate guy that likes to play with data. Okay? So I really want to hear from you. And again, as Laura said, this is very much the broader impacts part of this research. We're doing all sorts of fancy, interesting climate questions that we've got, you know, that are very fascinating to us. It may not be fascinating to you, but I want you guys to be guiding our research. I want you to be helping us to make some sort of end product that is useful for you. Okay, I don't want this to be an ivory tower type exercise where I'm doing something that me and the half dozen people that cite my papers are interested in, but no one else in the, in the population is interested in. I want to I want to be very applied and very practical here. Um, on, a, on, a, on a lighter note, I've, I've been using this uh, 
this slide, this theme in PowerPoint for many years. And I was giving this talk to a room full of geographers one time. And someone asked me, is that, is that an anti-cyclone coming on the west coast of the United States? I said, no, that's Australia. <laughs> it's a see-through of <laughs> that's quite the globe. So that was a geographer that asked you that question. So, so uh, he, was, he was kind of embarrassed about that, that question. Um, and of course, you know, I have to say this, this, this project's supported by the National Science Foundation. We're very, very grateful to them for deciding to fund this. Um, it, it was funded in the second round, but um, still got it funded, so we're very excited about that. So um, I may be preaching to the choir uh, in here, but um, heat has a really big impact on health. Um, the CDC attributes about 700 deaths per year on average uh, to exposure to high temperatures, but that number is probably really, really underestimated. That's actual people that when the paramedics come along, the doctor comes along, cause of death is coded as hyperthermia. It's really likely that there's probably loads of other people dying from hypertension, from having a heart attack, for having renal failure, respiratory failure, their diabetes flares up, their obesity flares up. Something else actually kills them, but it was stressed and brought on by the exposure to the high temperatures. It puts a lot of stress on the body, and those inner gremlins are probably what flares up. Okay, so that's 688 deaths per year is probably really, really underestimated. We're probably talking more like a few thousand people a year are dying because they have that exposure, the stress on the body, and something else flares up and gets them. Um, and those things are called comorbidities, things that co-vary with uh, exposure to high temperature. And also, heat places stress on susceptible populations. So we're always thinking about people that are more vulnerable in the population. Um, in terms of heat, it's elderly people, it's people living in poverty, um, it's also young children, less able to regulate the body temperature. Um, it's pregnant mothers. There's been a lot of research work that's been done that says if you hit uh, a pregnant woman with a heat wave in her second trimester, the preterm delivery is about 20% more likely. If you hit a woman with a heat wave uh, the week before delivery, then stillborn, it increases quite a bit in, in likelihood. So there's big impacts on health. Um, across a lot of different populations, but particularly these ones that we consider to be more vulnerable. And I think that when we think about heat waves, and a lot of you emergency management types, and you brought the broadcasters and forecasters in here, what do you think the public pays more attention to? Do you think they pay more attention when you tell them that there's a tornado or a hurricane coming, when they can picture the winds, they can picture the flooding, they can picture the damage, they can picture buildings getting blown over, or when you tell them it's going to be hot? Right? When, it's, when there's a lot of heat, I think people don't see the media attention. I mean, what would the cameras be pointing at when there's a heat wave? Not a whole lot. We can have infrastructure failures with a heat wave. Um, I remember in 2003 in the UK, right, where I'm from, um, it was so hot that the railway lines were buckling. We couldn't send a train down the track. Maybe not as big a problem here, but in the UK and in Europe, <coughs> when people can't take a train anywhere, it's a big transport disruption, right? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? So. Big infrastructure impacts here, you know, you see it in Phoenix and places like this, when the air temperature gets really, really high, planes can't take off because they can't get the lift that they need under the wings. So there is the potential for infrastructure impacts, but it's not the same. It's not the same as a hurricane coming through and flooding somewhere, or blowing down buildings, or, or you know, uh, uh, destroying coastlines, right? We don't have the same public attention. So really, I consider heat waves to be more of a silent killer. You just think of them as, as the Grim Reaper scything its way uh, his way across the across the landscape. And these are some interesting images I have on here. This is inside of a French hospital in 2003. Um, so I mean, say what you will <laughs> about uh, socialized medicine, but the French have a really, really good healthcare system. And it's really unusual to see people stacked in, in hallways on journeys in France. Um, but they had to during this heat wave in France. There was several thousand people excess mortality dying every single day during the peak of that heat wave over about a two-week period. So it was a massive event. Um, the official numbers are somewhere around about 30,000 people died in that event in Europe in 2003. Wow. It's probably more likely that it was 70 to 80,000 people that died in about a two-week period in 2003 across Europe. So huge uh, impacts. This is the funny one. This is a guy in a speedo lying in a cemetery, which I quite like. Um, and then this one over here. <laughs> Um, this one over here is a guy walking in Moscow, actually, in 2010. They had a big heat wave event centered in Moscow in 2010. 
And this guy's walking around. You can tell he's in, you know, he's in Moscow. It's unusual to see someone wearing shorts and t-shirts in Moscow. You think of bears and woolly hats and a lot of snow in Moscow. But it's obviously hot. But you also notice that he's wearing a mask over his face. So a lot of the time heat waves are what are called compounded events. We have really, really high air temperature, but we might also have wildfires going on at the same time because a heat wave is happening when it's very hot, it's been very dry, you've got dry vegetation, the risk of wildfire goes up. So when you combine really high temperatures, anyone in here got asthma or anything like that, you know when it's really hot, it's hard to breathe. Okay? When you combine that with low air quality, it gets really, really hard to breathe. Uh, so this is, you know, it's, it's heat wave is not just potentially the only thing going on. There can be compounding factors uh, coming in as well. This is a, an interesting figure that I like to show. This is from a bit of an older study now from 2002. But what they did was they looked at 11 cities in the eastern United States. So we're talking about 11 cities in what we might consider very similar situation all up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. We've got uh, Boston, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC, Charlotte, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Tampa, and Miami on here. Now these lines are showing temperature on the x-axis and risk of death on the y-axis. And you'll notice that obviously when it's really, really cold, we've got a risk of people dying in cold weather. Okay? But you'll notice that when we get to room temperature, we get a minimum risk of people dying. And then when it starts to get warmer than that, you see a very sharp increase in the risk of people dying. And that slope there across all of these, well, virtually all of these 11 cities, is much steeper than the cold slope was. Right? So you suddenly see this really rapid increase here. And epidemiologists like to call this the heat slope. Because epidemiologists are very interested in trying to translate this temperature using a linear or maybe not linear relationship, trying to translate that into risk of people dying. So they're trying to predict, okay, if we have these temperatures, we expect this number of people uh, to die. But what's interesting about this is that these 11 cities in the eastern United States all have a different response. That slope is very variable. We've got one here that's not even trending up. Right? So we've got very varied response across 11 cities that you would think would be demographically similar. You would think that they might have very similar social economics. You'd think that it would have a similar response to heat, but we don't see that. We see a huge variability across space, which makes studying heat waves really, really difficult. Because I would argue that you can't have one definition of what constitutes a heat wave across a large area of a country. Right? What constitutes a heat wave in Miami is not going to be the same as a heat wave in New York. So I think that makes sense. Of course. So there are many, many risk factors uh, for hyperthermia. And these are, these are interesting. I don't want to go through all of these. But it's very interesting. You go from up top there, age and gender, you know, individual physiological characteristics. And you start going down this list, <coughs> pre-existing medical conditions, poverty, homelessness, social isolation, access to health care. And then you get into more neighborhood characteristics down here. So we've got, we've got risk factors here that go from the individual to the community level. It's very, very broad. So I always tell, you know, when I'm talking to my students, my undergrad students, I've got, you know, 18 and 19 year old guys that think they're invincible, you know, and I tell them, you've probably got something on here that makes you at risk during a heat wave. Maybe physically you're not at risk, but maybe you're a young, healthy guy and you live in homelessness. Maybe you're a young, healthy guy and you're in poverty. Maybe you're a young, healthy guy and you're lacking access to health care. Maybe you're a young, healthy guy and you live in a high crime area. Right? Something is going to get you on here potentially. So it's very, very interesting that we have these individual to community level characteristics of what makes you more vulnerable during a heat wave. And interestingly, actually, guys in the middle age groups from late teens to middle age are more vulnerable during a heat wave than ladies are. We've found. And so it's interesting that that's the case. Maybe it's physiological differences. Maybe it's behavioral differences. The guys are idiots. We tend to go out and do sports when it's too hot and we shouldn't be doing that. Right? And also there's occupational differences. Right? It still tends to be the case that guys are more likely to be out doing construction work. They're more likely to have careers that take them outside, which I think is sad, but that's still the case. Right? So we see this difference between gender and a lot of the other risk factors on here. Very, very interesting. So I wanted to, to pause for a second 
right? well, maybe for five or ten minutes. And I'd like you to break up into groups, and this is where you earn your free lunch. Uh, this is where you're going to answer these questions for me. So I want you to, to kind of brainstorm, and what we're going to do is we're going to get into groups, and you're going to work as a little group, and you're going to try to answer these questions for me. And then after five or ten minutes, maybe 15, I don't know, let's see how we go. We're going to get back together, and I want you to talk with me. We're all going to share our ideas about the answers to these questions. And so don't get too distracted by Winnie the Pooh. I know he's, I know he's cute. But what actions do you take during a heat wave? And that can be personally. What do you do with your family if you're exposed to a heat wave? It could be professionally. What do you do in your job right, if there happens to be a heat wave? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm really interested to know what, what do you do immediately. Uh, could be what you do in, in, in preparation, if you know there's going to be a heat wave next week. Um, could be anything, but let's hear about it. Um, what information do you look at? Right? Are you looking at meteorological information, I assume as a forecaster? Are you looking at population information? Are you looking at um, uh, admission to hospitals? Uh, what, are you, what information are you pulling on to, to inform yourself during a heat wave? Um, and what information do you wish you had? What do you really think, if, if there's a heat wave happening, you know the information you've got, what would you really love to have? You know, shopping list here, you know. Dear Santa, what would you really like to get? And then how could you use a seasonal heat wave forecast? That's the goal of this work, is to try to give you information that we can uh, forecast, you know, maybe three to six months before the event. And so how would you use that? Would, that? would that be useful to you? What would you do with it? How would it inform you during a heat wave event or in preparation for a heat wave event? All right? So how are we, how are we doing this? All right. So we do just want to break up into groups based on kind of where you're sitting. All right? And so kind of this group back here turn toward each other. This group turn here. This group turn here together uh, this way. So just groups of uh, four, five, six. That way you guys figure it out and you'll stay with that group the rest of the day. So just kind of break up like that. I'm going to tear off some of these sheets and bring each group one of those big sheets. Y'all talk about it, get your answers, and then I want you to put the high points of that discussion on that big sheet. And then we're going to put it up on the wall and somebody will speak from your group about what you guys come up with. Okay, you've got pads of paper here that you can take your notes on to build that, to go back to that. But we want you to, you know, speak back out after you've had this discussion. So go ahead and start kind of moving yourself in that direction. The easier way to do is just to turn those chairs. Yeah, and let's get some questions for you guys. I have a question. I mean, we came in kind of late. What's, what's the definition of the heat wave? We will be getting to that, actually, in the next couple of slides. I'm not, I'm, we're not there yet. Um, and you'll actually be breaking out, the next breakout that we have in like another 20 minutes or so is how do you define heat wave? Okay. Um, you guys introduce yourself. Hey guys, I'm Eric Carpenter from the Weather Service in Jackson. Hello everybody. Good morning. Uh, I, I do have a question for you. We yeah. a graph that showed the northern cities versus the southern cities. Yeah. And what yeah, yeah. been the great. Um, one question I have on that, there, there are some differences between, um, say, like Charlotte and Miami. And I was wondering, how does that correlate with latitude? Uh, there is some difference. I mean, is my, does it happen to be that Miami is that, that lowest? Yeah, one? this this is Miami down here that isn't showing a response. Well, I would argue that, you know, they've cut this off here. If you get up to higher temperatures, up okay. that line is eventually going to, at some point, it has to pick back up again. Um, but you can see here that they've, they've got solid lines for northern cities, dashed lines for the southern cities. It's mostly the northern cities that have that steeper response, okay. that's that steeper heat slope. <coughs> so when the, in terms of latitude, yeah, the more north you are, the more that risk seems to pick up quickly. And I think a lot of that has to do with adaptation. Right? Okay. People are just not used to high temperatures yeah. the further north you go. So when you hit people with really high temperatures that they're not used to, then you see a bigger impact on mortality. And morbidity. Oh my gosh. Thanks. Sure. Like Northern cities don't have that. Feel free to ask any questions at any point. Yeah. I can tell you if it gets above 72 in Michigan, they're turning the air conditioning on. Yeah. So, whereas we have wet jackets on here. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that, you know, there's, there's still a significant number of people. You may have missed my numbers too when you came in. Uh, there's a 
fairly significant number of people dying every year in heat wave events. And this number here is, is a, a strict cause of death coded as hyperthermia exposure to high temperatures. There's probably thousands more people every year that are dying because something else flares up in their body, like they have a heart attack or they have respiratory failure because the heat's placing stress on their body. And even a low, I mean, a lot of people think, well, we, need, we, don't, need to bother, we don't need to bother about heat waves because we all have AC. But we still have significant numbers of people dying, even though we have pervasive AC use across the United States. I mean, people argue with me, okay, there was 70,000 people died in Europe in 2003 in a heat wave because we don't have air conditioning over there, right? I mean, I, me growing up, I had central heating, but I didn't have AC in my house, right? Sure. But in the US, we have AC, but we still see a fairly significant number of people dying. And that's a really interesting question. Do you have data for Alabama? I don't. I don't have data here with me okay. for Alabama, no, no, okay. unfortunately. Just curious. Yeah. All right, so we group, and, you know, as you want to get grouped up, and I'll bring the paper around. And like David said, you know, ask questions, you know, while you're in your groups, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and yeah, here I'll Aaron will come around. Run around, around I'll get my daily exercise. There you go. Got my step count to run. Yeah. So we're going to do it by question. So we'll go around to each of the three groups by question. So who's going to speak for group one? I have nominated as the broadcaster. <laughs> yes. You can stand up, come up here, or you can stand up, whatever you want to do. Sure, I'm up for their seat. Um, so what actions do you take? Um, a National Weather Service grant has really talked about how they utilize social media. And um, that's the main action to take since that's what mainly people are looking for. Uh, and then also just the messaging about what warnings and the level that they're at as the actions to get the message out to them. Um, that messaging is very important. Even the wording of that messaging is very important to get people to pay attention to that. Um, and then also uh, working with EMA partners. Uh, definitely you have to work with all of the EMA partners um, to try to get them to also take action. And that's the action we would take. And then communicate with employees. We have our Alabama Power Friends. Uh, here with us, so communicating with all the different employees is the main action so that they know what's happening. Uh, the information. We're going to get good by question. That's so, right. Yeah. I'm done. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Go stand over here. Make it easier to watch for Thanks, Sean. So, um, we just decided that like from a personal standpoint, we decided to say, stay inside, uh, drink water, limit exposure, and make sure you dress appropriately. I mean, I think those are just the, the basics that, that most people can do, um, especially here in the South. So, that's. Yeah, it's interesting too, when you think about, you know, the individual thing, do people know that? You know, when we talk about messaging, we make assumptions about what people know to do, and you just wonder how many people know to do that. Yeah, yeah I think we took more of a, personal um, approach with ours, um, talking about maybe some of the cultural differences in the South, about how we kind of know we're in tune with what to do, um, like staying inside and out, out of the sun, and uh, somebody mentioned competitive shade parking, just an example. <laughs> doing, things, uh, doing things early and later in the day. Um, Checking in more with the elderly, so um, those are some of the things that we. So can I ask a follow-up question? The group that did the social media post about social media, like how successful have those, and like who who uses them? Especially like thinking like I would imagine a hard time like older populations getting linked into the social media side. So are there alternatives to get that information out there? Yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more, but you want to yeah. um, Well, just for all of our followers that follow us on Facebook and Twitter, which is National Weather Service. National, 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 yeah. Sorry, National yeah. Weather Service, Birmingham office, Tallahassee, Mobile. And so we try to get creative to keep people interactive, whether there's weather or not weather going on, thunderstorms or heat. Mm -hmm. And so the more you keep them interactive and get those followers going and get the conversation started they share with people and they tag their grandma and their aunt and everybody else onto those posts that we put out and that helps get action spreading and from I'll, there. I'll add to that too because we 
I, I'm an EMA, so we use National Weather Service information as like our primary source of getting information. And we will have a lot of media that will call us and want to do interviews. So we can take the information that the National Weather Service is putting out, and then we do that on camera, which is reaching those older populations because they're more likely to be watching the news. So we can get the information that way too. Yeah. And, and part of that messaging is if you're if you have family who is not on social media and that doesn't yeah. have access to that, check on them. Right. Yeah. That would be the other part I think of the messaging part. We've even tried to do different ways of communicating, like we worked with AIDB um, um, with the hearing impaired, mm -hmm. and to try to get uh, safety messaging out with interpreters to share with, them, <coughs> with that population as well. So that's great. It's trying to get think out of the box, yeah, I guess. That's what you need for this. Okay, Jake's going to tell us what's uh, coming over the webinar. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to read this. Um, because we got some really thorough answers from our online participants. Um, we have our broadcast meteorologist who brought up what I thought was a really good point, um, is to consider about if it's a weekday or on the weekend, how would that change your habits? Are you more likely to be outside on the weekend? Um, and we also have a distribution engineer from Alabama Power um, who also added something I thought was very interesting. Um, said that they, um, there are not many different actions they would take during a heat wave. They're, Typically, their system peaks during the winter months, um, so the loading is not as much of an issue during heat waves. They have multiple contingencies, um, and so they just try to have all those available during the highest uh, summer load months. See, that's interesting to me because I think of, so I do a lot of work in South Africa, and when it becomes too hot there, they do load shedding. So a uh, power goes off, for, and they tell you when it's going to happen. So extreme heat is, is a very different concern for them there versus what you, what was just said. <coughs> All right, so question two, what information do you look at? Um, so once again, we have the really high tech national weather <laughs> service group. So they're looking at the models really looking uh, hardcore at the scientific science behind all of that and then also the history of heat waves and how um, how those patterns have been in the past of course and then the uh, different temperature and heat uh, indexes uh, that are available in the forecast and really looking at the, the days the times and uh, all the information that is out there from our scientific Let's go to two and then we'll go. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll just yeah. So, <laughs> we got nice ones. Yeah, we did. Um, so, we kind of, once again, we kind of stuck with what personal people do because um, I think a lot of us, we're more on the social side of things or the, on the software side of things. So, we're kind of a different group. But um, we, we just want to make sure that we know what the temperature is, kind of what constitutes a heat wave. So if we could know that, that would help us make better plans. And then, um, you know, and some of that is like knowing the forecast, like the immediate forecast within six to 10 days. And then also um, what's a dangerous heat index, especially for down here. I mean, we could, it could be 95, but feel like 105. So, uh, you know, it's just trying to understand from our point of view, um, what are those thresholds, so to speak? What are those thresholds to really start uh, understanding that, hey, there might be a problem here, and how do we communicate that to people around us? And I think you'll actually do a really good job of that. Thanks. Yeah, ours is pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, we have some uh, emergency management people in our group, and they're, they're pretty much NWS, National Weather Service, uh, web pages, um, apps, things like that, although we don't have an NWS app. Stuff that you know, just basic general information, forecast information. Thank you. Um, I kind of want to ask just a follow up about whenever we talk about history, um, what types of analogs are, are you guys looking at specifically on the NWS side? Is that or is that kind of what you mean? Analogs? Yeah. Oh yeah. We absolutely. I mean, it's, we were just talking about this. It's really hard to forecast heat outbreaks. Um, it's hard to say we're, we're in a uh, La Nina or El Nino and it's going to be a real hot summer this year. It's really tough. I mean, the other weather service folks here might think differently. I, you know, it's just in my experience, it's, it's not really easy to uh, 
but yes, analog, historical aspects. Um, I guess that was your, so I mean, you, yeah. you certainly could look at analogs. I look at analogs a lot. Yeah, we keep records for Central Alabama for like, like top historical heap events. And so we could look at climate records to see like, let's say for Tuscaloosa or Montgomery and all, see if they're getting, how many records are they getting? Are they, you know, has this been going on for a week? Things like that. And so we can try to compare it, but you know, since we're normally just looking at mostly the seven day forecast, we'll look at our local climate records to kind of help us out a little bit. Okay. Um, and then we've got some uh, answers from our online people. Um, our meteorologist says that he uh, is looking at forecast data similar to uh, the other groups here. Um, and he says he focuses uh, really more on heat index over the specific air temperature. And I know we're going to get into some of those thresholds a little bit later. Um, and our uh, attendee from Alabama Power um, says that they gather information from the Alabama Weather Blog, which is run by uh, one of the broadcast stations out of Birmingham. Uh, they use Weather Underground's historical feature to look at uh, what load was during the previous weather conditions. Um, and then they uh, typically listen in on the NWS Birmingham weekly uh, <coughs> during that. And they also have a resident meteorologist that has, has do most major utility. Sean. Can I ask a follow-up question again? Sorry. So sure. with these, going back to these apps again, do you feel like you're successful in getting the information out there, or do you guys still like plan or other strategies, or do you feel like you've diversified enough that that you guys have a solid game, you know, ground game? I can't answer for all of you know, the offices, but I, I feel like we can never reach enough. Yeah. yeah. You always want to try to what else can we do mm -hmm. to reach more people because there's always some part of the population you're not reaching. You know, if you have a, a big Hispanic population, you want to try to message in Spanish, you, you know, or what other populations, what other languages are being spoken in our 39 counties that we're not aware of. So when you ask that question, I think of after Hurricane Michael, we were issuing heat advisories. Mm -hmm. The communication was incredibly hard after exactly. that. If you have not had any power, cell phone power is being down. And so, like, that's where I think, like, our messaging really was challenging to reach people. <laughs> on a normal day, like yes, there are areas we can improve and reach more people, but in that kind of situation, when you're dealing with other extreme. impacts. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Okay. All right. Third question. What information do you wish you had? Uh, or you have to explain this black hole. <laughs> um, so one of them was uh, what bulb globe temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, one of them, in terms of information that we wish we had on the NWS side of things, uh, both Jessica and I mentioned wet bulb globe temperature um, because it, it handles, um, I guess it handles exposure a little bit differently. Heat index typically looks at um, if you're shaded, whereas wet bulb globe temperature looks at cloud cover um, and uh, a little bit more of um, some solar, yeah, sun angle. Solar There you go. Um, so it, it could handle, um, it, people that are outside, it could handle, um, I guess, their stress um, a little differently than the heat index, but um, we don't know a whole lot, at least I don't, about what bulk globe temperature. I just know that a lot of um, folks use it, so it would be something good for us to, to show it. I have heard that some uh, sports with schools may limit their activities outside practice activities and things like that according to the wet bulb globe temperature. I think that was, that was derived from the military, isn't it already? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And there's actually like Duke University, they um, calculate wet bulb globe temperature during events, um, during their football games, and they'll actually be proactive in giving out like free water, so. Interesting. I thought that was very interesting, just the better measurements overall <coughs> that they were talking about and how to convey and um, Messaging about that, and so messaging to vulnerable populations. We talked about how we wanted to make sure uh, that the information was on digital billboards as people came into different cities and areas, because those have definitely grown over the years, no matter what cities and areas you have. And with them being more along the coast, where you have people coming there on vacations and things like that, to make sure that uh, those billboards and the partnership 
uh, with the transportation uh, departments that that is all in, in place. Uh, so we, we had that information and then um, the best source of weather information because I was kind of asking them, you know, where, how do people know when you go to Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, where to get the best information for the heat for that day? You know, do people actually know where that best source is? Yeah, so for us, we went back to just again, accurate seasonal forecasts. We felt like that would help uh, help people plan for the next series or whatever, or, 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 or span of time. But as you were talking about, you know, I think, uh, I think maybe if we could look at some more community involvement, maybe those conversations that aren't happening, maybe we can find a way to, to involve that. So if we had more information on uh, groups inside of cities or municipalities that could be directly involved in some conversations. I, I wonder if perhaps in that information could be then propagated easier. Say churches or um, you know community centers or something of that nature. So as y'all were talking, that kind of sparked an interest. And uh, from the EM and public safety side of things, we had a hard time going beyond just having temperature threshold information. Uh, it's more about maybe duration, knowing how long the planning purposes, uh, knowing how long the event was going to last was an important thing. And then a few other things to consider um, is sort of what we've already talked about on, in a similar um, regard as just wishing they had more of a heads up about heat waves and other weather events in general and being able to accurately and precisely produce a forecast um, beyond seven days out would be really useful. Um, and some of my personal research is how do you communicate some of those longer range forecasts graphically and so I think that may be something that we can talk about a little bit later. Um, the other thing, and this is right up, you know, what we're talking about, Dr. Gillings, is from the uh, power company is just having a longer range forecast so that they would be able to plan if it looks like there's going to be extended or particularly extreme high magnitude event that would really be helpful for them. All right, last question. How could you use a seasonal heat wave forecast? Okay, kind of building off of what he just said, that communication I think is the most important because like I teach students how to prepare information in a concise and creative way to get people to remember it. And I think that same type of communication is what we would need to um, from the seasonal wave forecast to help our uh, meteorologists, the National Weather Service, figure out the best way that people could retain that information. I mean, there's no point in communicating it if they can't understand it. So we're trying to boil it down to where they can uh, put it to use. And then also um, pushing that preparedness and that information, like giving steps. And kind of like we've all done here, like what kind of things should you do if that's happening with that forecast so we could use that information that way. And then just planning out our resources. Um, we had, you know, Alva Power and EMA in our group too. It was how do you plan to give out that information? What resources do you have to help people? And then how the last one was, um, I came to mind like I always know nonprofits are giving out, you know, fans and trying to make sure that people have what they need in those vulnerable populations that we talked about. So providing that information to support those nonprofits and help them get the word out to them of where they can get those resources. So that seasonal heat wave forecast can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, I think a lot of it does boil down to communication so people can take that forecast and put it into action. Yeah, yeah to play off that, we were, we were thinking the same thing. I mean, how could municipalities and cities really plan ahead for, you know, uh, being able to have cooling centers for be able to provide uh, utilities for people that may not have it. Uh, and you know, along with that, you know, when the heat wave comes in, utilities go up. Now, not necessarily power, uh, which I just learned, which I didn't realize, but I mean, people have to use more water, they have to use, um, you know, other types of utilities more potentially. And, you know, the poorer communities would not have the availability as much to take over that financial burden. And so maybe we can find ways to help with that. Um, professional staffing for hospitals and for clinics. You know, if there's a heat wave coming in, they can plan ahead. And if they know that this particular uh, time of year is gonna be really bad, well, they can have a staffing prepared and ready. And, I, and that's not something I've even thought about, so that was really interesting. Um, yeah, and so I think that's all. We, 
we had a lot of the same kind of discussion. Um, I guess uh, just adding to that would be um, the uh, EMS side of business, uh, medical side, uh, planning for um, medical centers and hospitals. Okay, we're going to have more heat related casualties, things like that. Uh, maybe outdoor events, significant outdoor events where you might have, you might need more resources for that. So um, as far as the actual forecast, it's really, uh, it's really tough, like I was saying earlier, to come up with a good seasonal forecast for heat, uh, heat waves. Um, we definitely need, there's definitely room to be better with that, so I'll say that. Yeah. And I don't really That's what we're here for. But, yeah. <laughs> That's what we're here for. So. Do we make that happen? Yeah. Um, and what you guys have all illustrated here is, you know, if we can get more advanced information out there, there's a psychology factor involved for the individuals. How do you get people to start thinking about something that's way off in advance? That's one of the hardest things with this kind of information is to get their attention. But when you break this down, you begin to realize in places like hospitals, utilities, there's a lot of entities that need that information early on so that they can plan. And so there's this thing of, you know, how do you get the information out to the people far enough in advance so that they can do all the planning they need to do, then get it out there for those individuals who aren't ready to think about it. You know, that's too far down the road. So you're trying to get their attention. You're trying not to fatigue them with the information. You know, with, you know, everything that you disseminate in terms of warning communication, where you get that information out at what point in time, well, the, the real savvy people are like, yeah, I want that information. Other people are like, I don't want to hear about it right now. I'll worry about it when it happens. Or it's probably not going to happen. So you're up against all of that. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about all of this. Back to you. So yeah, thanks guys. That was that was really really useful. I, you know, as I'm standing here listening to you all, I think that um, uh, you know what hit me was was first of all better communication. I think that was a big theme of what, what all of you were talking about, um, and also better availability of information. And whether that's information on of a seasonal forecast nature, or whether that's better information in terms of uh, what data we collect, or whether it's having wet bulb low temperature. Um, this is something that I struggle with a lot, is, is actually, we're going to get into this next, is how to define a heat wave event. Um, when I'm thinking about it as a, as a climate person, I'm thinking about a heat wave as being unusually high temperature for that location. And that's, that's a very basic definition, I guess. Uh, you know, but we've talked previously, that slide with the, all of the curved lines, that really what constitutes a heat wave is so variable from place to place. Um, in, in my work, being a, being a climate guy, I need a long record to work with. I need to, you know, if I'm doing some sort of statistical modeling, I need that larger data set. Um, and so wet bulb globe temperature is not always immediately accessible to me, and it's not always accessible at a fine spatial resolution, never mind the, the long temporal scale uh, that, that I need to work with. So that defining a heat wave is, is really, really tricky and, and we have a kind of sort of joke um, in, the, in, the, <coughs> you know, in the academic uh, field of, of heat wave research that there's almost <coughs> as many heat wave definitions as there are academic papers on heat waves, you know, so um, every time someone publishes something on heat waves, they're using a slightly different definition. I'm very much in favor of relative definition based on crossing a high percentile of that location's temperature, um, but then we can think about things like duration, we can think about um, bringing in other aspects like obviously humidity and things like wet bulb low temperature that give you more of an idea of actual exposure. Um, so it's, it, that, that is very tricky, but it's something that I want to I talk more with you about. Um, and, and then I, I also kind of got, you know, that we need better information to inform, uh, you know, first responders in some way, but medical professionals, um, people that are that are planning, utility people, um, and you know, I, te I teach a class actually called climate change and health. And one of the, one of the, it's, a, it's, a, it's very much a survey class, and we look at any way that, that climate and changes that we have seen impact health. Everything from heat waves, uh, hurricanes, to things 
uh, more like vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases, food nutrition, loads of different things. And, and one of the, the primary themes that kind of comes out in all of it is that we need better communication between the researchers and the practitioners. And I think that um, having a better, let's not call it education, but mm -hmm. having medical practitioners like doctors, nurses, more aware of what they're potentially going to be facing, uh, uh, you know, with, with some uh, lead time, uh, it would be really beneficial. And I think that that's, that's something that is uh, really important here. Um, uh, the other kind of interesting thing was you talking about the utility uh, side of things, and I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't aware uh, that utility use kind of went down in the summertime. Um, I'm just thinking everyone's cranking up their AC. I mean, I know there's been some work um, where there's been a sort of suggestion that, um, particularly if we're thinking about vulnerable populations, poor people, very, very vulnerable during a heat wave, there's been some suggestion that, um, you know, and I think this is something that is done, is that you don't cut off uh, for lack of payment if there is a heat wave warning at the time. Um, you may cut off the next day, <laughs> you know, but um, that's, I think, something that we need to, uh, still need to think about. Um, and it's a very different situation depending on what you're talking about. But think back to Europe, um, you know, France, for example, during that 2003 heat wave, they had a huge spike in power use, and they actually had, I mean, they're a big fan of nuclear power in France. They had uh, reactors that were sort of overheating, not just because of the extra power use the output, but also the uh, uh, the heat, the temperature of the heat wave. Um, so that's that's. Uh, really interesting as well but uh, let's let's get back to this um, so I think the keyboard has checked out maybe does it switch off after not being used for a while term and when we've got data potentially that goes back to 1950s that has high spatial coverage um, what I'm going to be showing you actually begins in 1981 uh, the PRISM data set that some of you may be familiar with out of Oregon State um, but what we're doing is it's over multiple decades we're, we're tracking heat waves and, and very much spatially and I'm, again I'm going to show you this more in depth in just a second but that idea of analogs would be very cool because what one of the outputs of this research is trying to create a spatial database, if you want to think of it like that, of heat waves that have happened. So you would have those analogs to look back at and say, okay, we're seeing these sorts of synoptic conditions, we're seeing these sorts of teleconnections happening, and this is what we saw in the past with those conditions, so this may be what's going to happen now um, in terms of size, shape, magnitude, and what you see on the landscape. So, yeah. Now, Kind of going in line with that, the like 1980 heat wave is like a great benchmark. I mean, I look, yeah. I look at if I see 850 millibar temperatures that are pushing 24 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I know we're looking yeah. a lot of trouble. 80, um, yeah, 80 big. Uh, 88 was was pretty big too. Yeah, um, yeah. So this is the thing that we're, we're so we're going to have this 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 database that you could go to and be looking at. Okay, that was a bad year, what was going on in terms of atmospherics then, and can you relate it to what's going on now? Yeah. And then you would have an actual map of what happened with the heat on a day-to-day -day basis from 1980 or 1988 or wherever, mm -hmm. and then you could apply it to today, so that, that would be something. That's very useful. Yeah. I can actually, another question? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what recently, you know, our, our criteria was kind of changed a little bit. We used, when I first came to the weather service, we uh, overnight low temperatures were considered uh, an important threshold. If it didn't yeah. get below 80 or much below 80 at night, that was an important thing. But now it's been kind of dropped as, a, as an issue. Um, but the idea, to me, is still important because 
the idea is that you don't recover much at night mm -hmm. when it's really muggy and warm. Um, which, how important do you, th you think we need to? I think that is. Need to consider that, or I think so. I mean, you know, again, I, I I'm coming at this from the physical side of things. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I do look at the literature and. There's been a lot of work that says that, yeah, nightly minimum temperature is very important for exactly what you're saying. It doesn't give people the chance to cool off. I mean, maybe, you know, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you're exposed to really high temperatures during the day, you still have that chance. At night, you get cool temperatures. You can maybe open up your windows. You, you get some respite. But um, if it's really high nighttime as well, in, in combination with the high daily temperatures, then you really see that increase. And I think, you know, with, with, with heat waves, we do tend, there's a chance that we see that a lot because a heat wave is going to be high humidity, so the chances are your nighttime minimums are going to stay elevated, mm -hmm. right? So, um, it just kind of builds up. Yeah, it kind of builds up. And so, if, when I'm looking at heat waves, I try to, a lot of the time in my work, I'm, I'm creating a, a bivariate approach of thresholds of looking not just at the, the daytime max, but also the min. And if it's if they're both elevated, then it's it's more serious. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <coughs> I would say any, any time, anywhere you can incorporate that, yeah, useful. Um, like, so well, I mean, absolutely, and so I'm going to, we're going to be looking a little bit at that whenever the, <laughs> whenever the keyboard comes back to life. Yeah, we're working on it. Was that your next slide, David? That, uh, I believe so, unless we've skipped. I think, yeah, I think he was able to. Oh, you're able to. Uh, yeah. this, oh, this was, okay. Well. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can't. I don't know if I can share the screen while this is doing this because I can't get out of this. So, uh, so the people won't see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. definitions of a heat wave. This is fairly basic stuff. This is you know, the sort of thing I give to my, my 101 students, thinking about how a heat wave happens. And basically, we're thinking about a heat wave, obviously, in, as a summertime event. Um, although you could have a relative heat wave in the wintertime, which is maybe not going to be life-threatening. It's just going to be abnormally high temperatures compared with wintertime temperatures. It's not going to be what we might think of as a heat wave. Um, generally, when we have a heat wave event, whether it's in the US or in Europe or anywhere else, you're going to have stationary high pressure. You're going to have a relative high. Um, you're going to have no clouds, lack of, lack of cloud cover. So you've got a full amount of solar radiation coming into the surface, being absorbed by the ground surface and radiating up and warming the air temperature up. If we don't have cloud cover, it's also likely we're not having uh, precipitation during a rainfall event, so you don't have evaporative cooling of the ground surface. And also, most of the time with a heat wave, we're thinking about also in combination with high humidity in terms of the heat index being elevated. If we have high humidity, you sweat and sweat, but you can't cool down your body effectively. Um, and also we can think about heat waves as, as a movement of air masses. So, you know, when you have Again, many of your forecasters, this is really basic stuff. But when you have a cold air mass move into a location where you have a cold front, like we had come through last night, you get a lot of heavy rain and then cold air. But you can sometimes have very warm air masses that maybe have a lot of humidity and then moving into locations where they don't normally hang out, and that could trigger a heat wave event. We already have around the US heat health warning systems in many major cities. Um, and that's basically what they're looking at. They're looking at the synoptic environment. They're looking at air masses and whether they're moving into that location and how abnormal they are compared with the air mass that they're displacing. Um, so we, we do that kind of thing already. Um, and then we also have this issue of thinking about the land surface. We're not just living on a flat canvas. We have different land cover types. And if you're in a location that is more vegetated, that has 
uh, uh, is more rural, then you're going to see less of an impact from a heat wave. If you go, if I walk from forest to suburban into an urban location, the temperature generally is going to increase because if you move in towards an urban environment, we call it an urban heat island, you're going to have more man-made materials, the steel, the concrete, the glass, they're all radiating out more heat than a vegetative surface would. So we have this really high spatial variation across the surface in terms of the actual uh, temperatures that we see. Although interesting fact, I did, I did find out a number of years ago that uh, in the Middle East, they actually have cold islands. So if you walk into a city there, you're coming out of the desert, you walk into a city, they have loads of vegetation because there's people living there, they plant stuff, and actually it's cooler as you go in towards the city there. So, but that's, that's neither here nor there for us. But. It's not working. I to get attention. <laughs> <laughs> Is your mouse working now? Yeah. Isn't what you just described basically what we're calling a cooling center? Where they grew vegetation and had shades and things like that? Right, yeah. That's our version of what it was. Perfect. Well, and so, well, I think what they're talking about in terms of cooling center is if we know there's going to be a heat wave, um, setting up a place in cities, like whether it's in you know a sports hall, in a stadium, somewhere that you can crank up the AC and you have a cool place that people can go to um, to get cool to rehydrate. Uh, so it's a sort of a, a, you know a, an oasis in the cities uh, to try to help people survive a heat wave. But the cities who deal with heat already so much are saying some of them are going in and setting up that urban heat island. Mm -hmm. But so, it so it's a, we do it very reactionary. We set up cooling centers if we know there's going to be a heat wave. They already. Well, no, this is no, this is a, this is a this is a phenomenon of a, an urban heat island being that all cities are urban heat islands. It just gets hotter when you walk in towards a city. Uh, generally, all other things being equal, the city's going to have higher temperatures than the surrounding landscape because of all of the built environment that radiates more heat. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> I appreciate your. This, the keyboard is not saying on this problem. Uh, it keeps like, disconnecting. If you press something, does it go to the next? Yeah. Why don't we try? Can we put it right here? Maybe it's yeah. a distance. Well, let's see, it just went off again. Oh, that is fascinating. How about that? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find the keyboard. I'm having trouble connecting this. So. Sorry. Hmm. So um, I'll just I'll push on. Um, this is a map of the, the continental United States, obviously. This is for August 12th of last year. Um, we had incredibly high temperatures. We had essentially a heat wave going on, particularly in Texas and parts of the Southwest. And you know, last summer was, was kind of a pretty exceptional summer. We had several events. And particularly that struck me was we had events that were very early on. I remember the, the uh, uh, what's the holiday at the end of May, sorry, not being American, Labor Day? Memorial, 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 Day. Memorial Day, there we go, right, <laughs> sorry. Memorial Day, um, we had at the end of May, right, really, really high temperatures, right? In May, it was it was unusually high, it was up to like, you know, close to 100 Fahrenheit around here at the end of May, really, really unusual temperatures. And so when we have something like this, covering a large portion of the continental US, and I'll put it over here, um, and as we look at this as a, you know, a, a weather map, this is showing pressure at 500 millibars. And so generally, for those that are not forecasters in here, generally what we have is a flow of air from west to east across the continental United States. And so typically what you might expect to see here on a normal day is slowly undulating isobars, the, the, the lines that are drawn on this figure. But when this 
heat wave was happening, what we see is this big blob shape down here. So this is the stationary high pressure that I'm talking about. A big area that's relatively high pressure where you don't have cloud cover and that's essentially baking. I like to describe it to people sometimes as imagine you're <coughs> sitting in a hot room and you've got a fan blowing on you. You're kind of okay, but imagine someone comes in and turns the fan off and you don't have any air circulation. It suddenly feels really, really hot really quickly. And that's what's happening here across the southern United States in August. We've got this big high pressure block in the atmosphere. It's like a big roadblock. Everything has to go around about it and really things stagnate and it gets really hot very quickly. So this is something that we why do I keep watching this? Something that we keep seeing uh, with heat waves. This is uh, an, an oscillation. So someone mentioned El Nino and La Nina earlier. Um, you may be familiar with that. The, Temperatures in the equatorial Pacific, uh, we have a really, really warm movement of sea surface temperatures from Australia and the Philippines towards Central and South America. Every three to seven years at random, when that happens, it's called an El Nino event. It involves so much energy that it changes the weather around the entire world in different ways. But it's a huge process that naturally happens. Another thing that happens that affects us quite strongly in terms of heat waves is the North Atlantic Oscillation. And this is a variation of pressure systems across the North Atlantic. So we've got a low pressure system that sits near Iceland, and we've got a high pressure system that sits down near the Azores island chain. Right? So we've got these two pressure systems, and we have two phases. Just like we have El Nino and La Nina, we have a positive phase and a negative <coughs> phase. We have a positive phase here where those pressure systems with a lot of closed-in isobars around about them are very strong. And that strong, what's called pressure gradient, difference between high and low there, really pulls winds across the North Atlantic. It keeps everything moving. It keeps the fan turned on. Right? But when it goes into its negative phase, we see weakening of those two pressure systems. And that means the fan is slowed down, the winds slow down, and things stagnate. So when we see this happening, it tends to be associated with those stagnant high pressure systems developing and someone turning off the fan and it getting really, really warm. So this is just a wire one. Okay, all right, well, I'll, just, I'll just use that yeah. instead then. All right, uh, yeah. Um, so when we, when we look back at 2012, summer of 2012, still one of the warmest years uh, so far in the United States that we have on record. Summertime of 2012, we saw the NEO going into its negative phase, everything slowing down a little bit, stagnation, and we saw a really bad heat wave event happening over a lot of the continental United States. This is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I just carry this. Or maybe I stand over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. So this is a, a imagining the, the top of the troposphere. The, the troposphere is the bottom layer of the atmosphere that we are in. And we have this sort of boundary between it and higher layers in the atmosphere. And this is imagining what the height of that looks like, the surface that's kind of floating here above uh, America, uh, North Atlantic and across to Europe. If we have a big stationary high pressure area or a big block in the atmosphere, we see that the west to east winds that we normally expect are going to go around about there. And this is what we saw in the 2003 heat wave in Europe. We had this big block in the atmosphere. Everything was having to flow around about it. And we had really, really uh, rapid increases in, in, in temperature. And that was most likely associated with the North Atlantic Oscillation. I don't think I put some results from a previous paper I've done on here. But what we found was when we have negative phases of the NEO, we see big increases in the likelihood as well as the magnitude of heat waves happening in Europe. So we see it over there, we also see it on our side of the pond as well. Um, this is a couple of interesting figures. These are from the US National Climate Assessment. So this is data going back to 1900 uh, through relatively recently. This report came out in 2017. And what we're seeing here up top is maximum temperature above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then down the bottom here, we've got minimum temperature above 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And these figures are showing the <coughs> days per year with those two conditions. So warm temperatures and nightly minimum temperatures. So this kind of gets what we were talking about. And here we're looking at change through time in terms of decades. Right? And what we see here is it was way warmer in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, particularly during the Dust Bowl era. If you look at temperature records for Tuscaloosa, the record high was 108 degrees Fahrenheit on, I think, July 30th of 1930. Right? We still haven't reached that temperature again. It was much, much warmer back then. We also know why it was warmer back then. There was a lot of land use mismanagement. There was a long period of drought. There was more transitioning or partitioning of 
uh, solar energy into sensible heat that we feel as heat um, versus latent heat flux from the ground surface. It was much warmer back then. But if we look from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and into the 2010s, we see again a rapid increase that's beginning to happen with days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And although most of the cities, most of the locations on that map are showing a percentage change, a decrease from 1950 to 2016, there are several cities like Birmingham, like New Orleans, like Raleigh, that are actually increasing their chance of having days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit very, very rapidly, and they're actually increasing their probability of having days above 95 Fahrenheit much faster than a lot of other cities around the United States. So we do have some places that seem to be getting quite a bit hotter in recent decades. If we look at the, the nights with temperatures above 75 Fahrenheit down here, again we see that 1930s stood out, but we see very rapid increases in that in recent decades, much, much more or larger increases than we see up here with the 95 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. This is, and I'm not I'm really going to get into this, but this is what we'd expect with climate change, this sort of this sort of pattern playing out where we don't see quite yet the big changes in daily maximums that we do in terms of nightly minimum temperatures. And most of the locations throughout the southern and southeastern United States are seeing big increases in these really hot nighttime temperatures. Another interesting thing to me um, about changes that we might be seeing or have seen in this case in terms of heat waves is their timing. So these figures, uh, it looks a little bit complicated, but what we've got along the x-axis is day of the year, right? Julian day of the year, right? So we're starting at day 130 and going through to 280 there, so basically covering the summer time, right? The summer months, as well as the spring and a little bit of the fall, right? And what I've got here, A is from 1950 to 1975, and then B is 76 through the year 2000. And this happens to be a location in Florida, but it's fairly indicative of a lot of the southeastern United States. And the curvy lines that look like railway tracks on here are showing the probability of having a heat wave by that day of the year. So the probability of having no heat waves, the zero line, the black, really uh, bold line, is dropping off as you move through the summertime, right? That's what we common sense expect, right? The more further I get into the summertime, the hotter it gets, the more likely it is that I would have at least one heat wave happen, okay? So we see that dropping off in A, and we see the probability of having one event, or two events, or three events starting to pick up as you move through the summertime. But then as we look down at B, the more recent decades, we see that it's changed a little bit, everything's shifted. The probability of having no events drops off sooner. The probability of having one event, two events, three events, four events, picks up sooner. So we're seeing a <coughs> change in seasonality of events. And when we talk about people's adaptation to heat, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, if I take someone from Miami that's used to high temperatures and I put them in New York and there's a heat wave in New York, the person from Miami is laughing, they don't really care, oh, that's this is just nice weather where I'm from. This is a normal summer day, right? Because they're adapted to the high temperatures. So if we hit populations with heat waves earlier in the summertime than when they typically happen, then we're messing with that adaptability, that adaptation that people have. We're hitting people with temperatures that they're not used to yet. They haven't got used to it being summer yet. We're hitting them with something that's really extreme. So that changing seasonality is something that really uh, interests me. <coughs> Um, if we think about change, um, not necessarily thinking about climate change, but if we think about change in the observational record, we can think about temperatures in terms of a statistical distribution. So what I've got here in these three images is a bell curve. Right? Imagine like you're back taking courses, some your professor shows you your grades on an exam. Right? I do this all the time right, with my students. I have a distribution of their grades. The person that gets the average grade, the average on the exam, is at the top of the bell curve in the middle. Right? That's the average temperature. Okay? The person that's failed is way down at the left end of the bell <laughs> curve, right, unfortunately. And the people, the eggheads, they're way in the right hand end, the tail, the right tail of the bell curve. And what we're seeing through time and potentially with climate change is that that entire bell curve is shifting a little bit to the right. And so if I had an exam, and I curve that exam. I always, <laughs> I always tell my students, I'm never going to curve an exam. <laughs> but if I did curve that exam, if I added 10 points to everyone's grade, what would happen? Well, the average grade would increase by 10 points. The person that really failed would 
be slightly less failing. And the person that got the person that got the A plus, the person the egghead that got 100 percent on that exam would now have 110 on that exam. So the person that was doing really, really well is now doing something that was not possible before. So if we apply this logic to temperatures, we see that if we increase the mean, we increase the likelihood or probability out there in the right tail, and we also move the left tail a little bit. And we're making it possible, or we're really increasing the probability of extremes out there, high temperature extremes, and potentially the likes of which that we haven't seen before in this statistical distribution. And with change in the climate, what we're seeing is not just a shift in that bell curve, but we're changing the variance in the bell curve. We're kind of squishing it flat a little bit. And we're pushing more probability out into those tails as well as shifting the entire thing to the right. So we're shifting it to the right and we're flattening it out. And the other thing that I would argue that we're doing that I've published the research on is that we're changing the statistical behavior of the tail. We're changing the, the shape of the tail. So not only are we shifting the whole thing to the right, we're flattening it out, and we're also changing the shape out there in the tail. So when you put all of those three changes together, those statistical changes, you really rapidly increase the probability of extremes out there that are usually very uh, rare events or events that we haven't seen before. You increase the probability, the likelihood of those happening. Now, if someone tells you that climate change is, is causing a heat wave, call bullshit and say that's a little crap, it's not causing it, but we are seeing changes in the likelihood of events like heat waves and hurricanes and hurricanes because of these changes. But if I was looking at this, and this is a, there's a lot of work done on this, I would be looking at saying, okay, I, I can estimate the probability of frequency of events, how many happen. I can look at the probability of events of certain magnitude. I can be looking at the probability of certain lengths of events and how they're changing through time. But I again came to this question of what about the spatial extent? No one's been looking at the size of events and how that is changing. This is a, an interesting website that you can go to. It's um, called the Climate Explorer. We've got the address up there. You can put in a zip code, a uh, name of a town, wherever in the United States, and then you can play with a lot of different figures um, of different parameters of, of weather and climate. This one just happens to be showing days per year with maximum temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if we look historically, and this is for Tuscaloosa, if we look historically in Tuscaloosa, over 1950 through the year 2000, on average, in an average year, we could expect just right around two days a year where temperatures might get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Many years we didn't have any temperatures at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but some years we had a few. Averaged out, it's about two per year. If we then look from 2000 onwards, the last couple of decades, we see that the average number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit is actually a little bit over five on average per year. And if we look into the future, and a lot of people have problems with climate models, but if we look into the future, mm -hmm. we see that that's potentially doubling again. But if we think about it just observationally, in the last couple of decades, we've had a lot more potential for days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit than, than in my lifetime and a lot of your lifetimes. Mm. This is, uh, again, from the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Um, what we've got here on the left is projected change in warmest temperature of the year. Right? So is the warmest, the hottest day of the year going to get warmer? And then on the right there, we've got projected change in number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So I like to think of the one on the right as warm summer days. Right? Are we going to see an extension of the summertime in terms of warm summer days? On the left here, we've got warmest temperature of the year. This is split up into different probabilities here. We've got a weighted mean of a lot of models, and then we've got a weighted mean of really hot performing models. Right? So we've got kind of the, the, the standard, and then we've got kind of the, the worst case scenario. And what we see is potentially two to maybe down here in the warmer models, up to six or eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer by the middle of this century. So this is projecting out to 2050, not to the end of this century, 2050, potentially that sort of increase in the warmest day of the year. And on the right there, what we have is, again, what's happening to warm summer days. 
potentially anywhere from around 30 to 60 more days a year where we have temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So essentially another month or a couple of months of warm summertime, potentially. So to go back to the research that we're more specifically doing, we're trying to conceptualize spatial changes in heat waves. We're trying to look at observational data sets and track change in size and shape of heat waves through time. And what, how we're doing that is, it, I'm really excited about it. Um, it's, it's a very interesting <coughs> thing that we're doing. We're taking methods that are normally applied in landscape ecology, normally people that look at forest areas, um, people that look at forest areas, and this is something that Aaron will talk a lot more about, people that look at forest areas and they want to know how big is the patch of forest? Um, how fragmented is the patch of forest becoming? How is that changing through time? And what is that related to? So we're taking the same sort of methodology, but we're applying it to heat in the atmosphere. So, very similar. And some of the results I'll be showing you here later on are for regionally uh, for the United States. So we've got these regions, and I'll, I'll have a little map up when I, when I show you those. This is one of the data sets that we've used so far. This is from uh, a climate group at Oregon State University. It's called PRISM data. It's interpolated from station data. It starts in 1981. It's daily data, and it goes through uh, the present. Um, this is what it looked like 1st of October through 3rd October last year. That was incredibly hot October, if you remember, right? It was unusually warm. And again, this is kind of what I'm talking about with changing seasonality of heat. Is it likely that we're seeing really intense, really unusual heat wave events way out kind of earlier in the summer and also much later in the summer than they used to have? Yeah. And certainly last October was, was one of those sorts of events. But this data is a fairly fine spatial resolution, so it allows us to look very closely across the landscape. So another breakout, right, enough of me talking. Um, I'd like you to think about how you define a heat wave. So again, now this may be somewhat uh, repetitive of your wet bulb globe temperature and that kind of thing, but I want you to think about how do you define a heat wave? And is it an atmospheric definition? Is it a definition involving people? Is it a definition involving health? Is it a definition involving uh, actions that you have to take? Any one of these things. You don't necessarily have to be a meteorologist to answer this question, but how would you define a heat wave? Whether it's personally or whether it's professionally, how would you define a heat wave? And do you think of heat waves in terms of how many people are, are dying, an impact on a population? Is it is it really, um, you know, is it for a heat wave to be happening, do we have to have <coughs> impact on the population? <coughs> and, there. and this definition that you may have in your mind or you may have professionally in your organization, does that definition vary spatially? Does it vary temporally? Does it vary based on where you are? what the population is, and does it vary through time? Does it depend when in this season we are, what the heat wave is? So that's what I'd like you to think about next. Yeah. That, that was really interesting about the NAO. I looked at that a lot, and yeah. well, I said the person that could predict, accurately predict the NAO has a lot of money. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of strong implications, but I usually look at it for winter stuff. Right. Um, I didn't realize, so the, the negative NAO in the summer correlates with the... Uh, yeah, there's a lot more work done on the wintertime NAO than the summertime NAO. But what we're hoping here is that maybe, just maybe, what's going on with the NAO in the springtime <coughs> is maybe going to be indicative of what might happen in the summertime. That's so, fair. Yeah, so if we, can, if we can say that, oh, you know, summers in the past, these analogs, We've had this sort of behavior from the NEO in the springtime and maybe even the wintertime. Is that related to what's going on in that summertime to get out of season before it goes through? Interesting. Okay, here's how I want to capture this one instead of on the big sheets of paper. In your groups, I want you to talk about your definition, but I want each one of you on those pads to have your own pad and be writing your definition because if you remember what he said, he wants to know from your perspective. So put your number, your group number, at the top of your piece of paper, one, two, or three, so we have a group that's coming from. Put at the top, heat, heat wave definition. Then also put who you are. You know, is it health, meteorology, emergency management, utilities, whatever you are, public, whatever you are in that group. And then as your group is discussing it, be putting down your definition on your sheet of paper. 
so that I can capture all of that. So each person in the group? Yeah, right. doing their own, as y'all are talking about it. Because y'all will be talking about it. And then we won't put it on the big sheet. What we'll do then is we'll talk about it as a group and we'll expedite that process. Okay, go for it. And again, you have questions? So, um, I'm, I'm hoping that we've got answers all across the spectrum here. Um, who, who wants to who wants to go first? Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. Since I'm not the meteorology expert, no. I'll get my wrong definition first. <laughs> there are no wrong answers. Right. There you go. Uh, no, that's not supposed to tell people to make them feel better. <laughs> there are wrong answers. At least I didn't say it after you said your definition. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> to me, a heat wave is a temporary phenomenon that has the following characteristics. High temperatures in relation to my location that has an impact on society, including health risks, economic impacts, and environmental risk and impacts. Very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was, that was oh, great. Good. I wish I'd written no. that one down. She <laughs> should write it down. <laughs> it's on paper. My research is done. <laughs> okay, so this is from the, a nursing perspective, right? A heat wave is any heat related event that affects patients um, and population health, particularly vulnerable populations, um, not just chronic disease, but also. Um, violence and crime. Who's next? Jump, jump, jump. You don't want to do it, you can get a prize. Lunch. <laughs> yeah, lunch. I don't necessarily have all this written down, but I was just trying to gather my thoughts. Um, <coughs> I would say, atmospheric condition wise, you, you have the heat wave lasting for a long duration period of time with not just high temperatures but overnight non-recovering period and with the public health is how is it in fact affecting impacting the public not just health wise uh, changing their plans which affects the economy and affects um, costs money and for the average public person and not only the major economy as well and, and, and health and then the variation uh, will definitely depend on extenuating circum circumstances both uh, what the weather has been like recently if there's other extenuating factors multiple weather events affecting that like a hurricane before a heat wave where people are more vulnerable than usual and then also your personal uh, circumstances because one person may have may have be affected differently than another person as well so personal uh, variability can change depending on heat wave which has nothing to do with anything that's going in the model <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that last bit <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately yeah, it's the x factor appreciate that. the human factor the human factor yes yeah the, the, the other thing that's kind of interesting along those lines but you were sort of saying that um you know, and a heat wave that's following some other catastrophic event mm -hmm. is going to be have to have a different definition. Yeah. So um, there's some. It's it's kind of interesting. Uh, some of the epidemiological work on heat waves, as you know, for example, the 2003 event. You know, that's kind of one that's been done to death in the literature just because of the huge impact that it had. Um, but when we were, you know, when we were looking at um, deaths in in that event kind of doing it as an epidemiologist type study, you're looking at excess deaths, you're looking at all cause mortality other than, uh, you know, someone shooting someone else kind of thing, you know, anything that could be exacerbated by heat. And you're looking at the number that are dying more than normal for other analog periods. So for example, if we're thinking about July of 2003, you take July of 2002, 2001, 2000, and you see how many people normally die in July of a, of a summer, and then you see how many more than normal were dying in 2003. But the interesting thing, when epidemiologists look at that, they're trying to, again, create that linear or not necessarily linear relationship between temperature and how many people they expect to die to try to predict it and to model it. Um, but when you have a heat wave event, let's say earlier in the summer, and then you follow it with a subsequent heat wave event, 
then you have a weird effect going on. Even if you try to create a model for the first event that works pretty well, it's not going to work for the next event because the first event, and they call it mortality displacement, they also kind of morbidly, morbidly call it um, harvesting. The first event kills off all the weak people in the population, and then the next event, even the maybe higher magnitude temperatures, but it doesn't kill as many people because you've lost all the people that were near to death in the first event. And I know that's terrible, <laughs> terrible to say, but that's something that really complicates it for epidemiologists when they're, when they're looking at heat. Um, so who, who else got any anything else for, for any burning? Right. Yeah, no, not first, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a hot topic. Uh, basically, I said the uh, definition on heat wave and when temperatures or when the heat index starts to exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and uh, there's not necessarily looking at more about uh, morbidity rates or health public health outcomes, but that is an indication. Uh, and the definition could vary depending on the impacts, such as health, the power, the economic, agricultural, or duration. Um, and then I have what I call a misery index, but that's, that's subjective because that's, a, that's really a relative thing between the heat and the humidity, especially down here in the southeast. So it, that 100 degrees, that's the reason I went back to 100 degrees um, heat index sort of like wind chill, I guess. It, it may be 98, but if it's 95 percent humidity, it's going to feel like over. Oh, that's something. I, I had a lot of the same things everybody said so far, but one thing I wanted to add, I, I've, I've actually coordinated with you, Mary, I believe, on a heat advisory. I'm sure I have. Before. Um, she's in Birmingham and I'm Jackson, so we, we're neighbors and we, we have to collaborate heat advisories and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny because even when you have specific thresholds um, of what a heat defines a heat wave, still like pulling teeth trying to collaborate. I'm not saying we had trouble, but it can be difficult trying to uh, follow a certain definition for a heat wave and what, what constitutes a heat advisory situation. And, and heat advisories are very critical because um, a lot of people act on those based on what you know, we, we issue those. Right, they, they unlock the doors to cooling centers and stuff like that. It sets up a whole pattern of response. Yeah, right. What, so, what um, NWS issues? This one <coughs> point. Yeah, I think that, again, like I said earlier, this, the, the issue of the what is the definition, how to define an event, is very, very tricky. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you would say that it has to be 100 Fahrenheit, that the, the feels like temperature has to be 100, 100 Fahrenheit. Um, you know, it, so is that is that's just a blanket as far as you're concerned? It's 100 Fahrenheit, and that's well, it's just, just a planning thing, really. Right. I mean, it's uh, I mean, like yesterday, you start looking at the weather forecast, and you, you've got the, the marginal slight enhanced and whatever. Well, as you go through those levels, we start doing things differently, mm -hmm. and that's the same thing with with heat. Is uh, for when I worked at the local level, once you started looking at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You start looking at, okay, we need to start having discussions about cooling centers. We need to start having discussions about outdoor events. We need to start having these discussions, and that's just a trigger point. I mean, we, we deal in, in trigger points, really, is at what level do we need to really start getting concerned about things. And you want to be on the left side of it, not the right side. Right. So, and the, yeah. more, the more observation, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should be passing this around. So. Yeah, the more observations we have, the, the denser network that we have, uh, the more you see the variability from the urban areas to suburban, the you know, forested areas like you're talking about. And it makes it tougher as a meteorologist at Weather Service. Um, you might see one site that's kind of an outlier, uh, that's like a lot hotter, and you might kind of blow it off a little bit and not want to issue an advisory. But for that area, it really is that hot. Um, you know, the, how, how homogeneous is it? You know, does it, how widespread is it? Do you, that makes a difference too. Right. Well, okay. Anyway, just two cents. Yeah, I mean, this is something when you say homogeneous there too, is something that we're thinking about here with this research. <coughs> is, 
is, is not just how big the event might be in terms of the total land area that it's covering, but also how, how fragmented the heat is. Um, and, and how that may, you know, impact how you guys would respond to, to an event. You know, if it, is, if it is a cohesive big blob of heat, um, you know where it is, but if it's very fragmented, then you, you've got a much more difficult decision of, I guess, where do you uh, put your resources, I guess, is, is kind of what my thoughts were on it, so it's interesting that's, that's kind of cool. Um, so that made me think of something that, you know, there's always a, a talk of, you know, needing more um, weather observation stations, and in a lot of cases that's for severe weather, most people think about it. I had never thought about maybe having just more temperature observations just to verify things, you know, is that city an outlier or, or what have you. Um, and then from um, the online participation, uh, something I thought was pretty interesting, um, both guys were pretty similar in that we, they were talking about how a heat wave or high temperatures in July are not all that uncommon versus if something's happening early in the season in May, for example, or if it's happening later in the season like October that has a much bigger implication on uh, how people respond to it um, and how they react to it. So I thought that was pretty interesting and was directly related to what we were talking about, about how the seasonality could, could change. Yeah. Other other thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, I've, and I've asked for a, a point of clarification, but I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, and that we were talking about: is there a, or, or maybe should there be a specific definition of a heat wave? Is there some threshold? And um, Spinks, who is a broadcaster, was talking about how um, he likes that there is some flexibility in using the term heat wave to try to get people's attention. And so what I asked was, is did he think it would be prohibitive if there was a specific definition uh, of a heat wave? I know we have specific criteria for, for the watches and warnings and advisories, um, but I thought that was an interesting point. You know, how how loosely can that term be used, or, and how loosely yeah. should it be used? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, we, you know, we all know what a Category 1, yeah. we all know what a Category 1 hurricane is, but we, don't, we can't say what a heat wave is. I work in nursing, and so um, this is very, very insightful um, to hear what everyone's saying. But um, are you, just a thing, are you saying that there is not, from a meteorological, meteorological perspective, a, um, a criteria with this heat wave? So you guys can just assign there's no this. Standard. There's no standard. Okay. So this, that in itself, to me, is very insightful. Um, <laughs> as a nurse and then also just as a human being living in Mississippi, <laughs> working in Alabama, because I would think there would be, uh, especially based on how other weather events are handled and the criteria that goes along with that and you know, how that's measured, even the outcomes of, of weather. So um, I think that's very uh, interesting. And I think that is something that, um, you know, coming from a healthcare standpoint um, is, you know, like it's a very insightful because we, I would anticipate that, and I know there's another nurse in here, Dr. Friend, but um, I would anticipate that that would be, you know, pretty standard. So um, for my definition, to be quite honest, of uh, what a heat wave is, is really based on what the weather service tells us. Um, so, you know, from my naive standpoint, um, you know, so, um, but I would think that there would be other things that, you know, the parameters would be very clear. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's it, it is really it is it's strange that we that we don't have a good definition of I mean the National Weather Service has a definition right of what a heat wave is, but you know it has to vary from place to place. And, you know it's not that you know when 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 you have a a, a Cat three hurricane coming up the coast of Florida, um, <coughs> everyone knows what that is. We know what that is, and it's going to affect potentially everyone's going to be, have, have to take the same sort of preparations. But when we say there's a heat wave, we don't really have a good handle of, okay, it reaches this temperature, that's a heat wave. But if it doesn't get to that temperature, well, that's not a heat wave. I mean, isn't it? You know, and it's going to depend on the underlying population. There's so much inherent variability of the impact, yeah. I think the key to it is, is realizing that it's not this temperature or this heat index, <coughs> it's the conditions. So what meteorological conditions are going to adversely affect some populace. That was essentially my definition. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Okay, because you think, um, I can talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the other way. Um, oh, yeah. Um, because 95 degrees is not going to affect Alabama as much as 95 degrees in Alaska. I mean, yeah. you got to think, I mean, the, the part of the country that you're living in, if there's a lower threshold, you know, because one, like you said, in some of places up north don't have air conditions. And so there's not only the region of the country you're talking about, how early in the season, and um, what are the customary ways of cooling, maybe, in that yeah. region. So not only the temperature. Cool. So that's why it's hard to just blanket one temperature. Um, it's when, really, the heat wave is when the ambient temperature starts having effects on society. And so it, that's the only way to describe it. But the only thing is the Weather Service tries to give a definition, a number value to everything to have criteria. And that's where we're trying to change to go to more of a, OK, yes, we have this number, but we also have to think outside and say, are we starting to have impacts? You know? As a consumer, though, I want a checklist. Right. Kind of, it's kind of what I'm thinking of as I'm hearing other ones talk. Because I was thinking in my head, like 95 degree temperatures look for multiple days, if it's a week or two. Because I was in France last summer during their heat wave, and you know it lasted. And then we were there during the middle when it they said it was over, and they came back. Yeah. And so it seems like they might have some definition of it. I don't know, but it was used very broadly. But then we were talking too about how when the temperatures don't go down at night, you know, is it 90 plus degrees temperatures at night as well and no rain. But it seems like there's got to be some kind of checklist. And he mentioned 100 degrees. To me, I'm just way up. He weighs 95, <laughs> you know, when it gets to 100, I'm really scared. I see both for you. Yeah, that's way too much for me. So. Yeah. Anybody else want to add? All right, what I want you to do is make sure you've written down all your thoughts about your definition. And like we said at the beginning, there is no wrong definition because it's all of this is important. That's what they're after is what is your perspective on the definition? What does it need to be for you? That's, that's what we're after here. So make sure you put your number on there, your group number, put your name, what you are, and then however you want to put your definition, however you want to explain it. And you can work on that as we're wrapping this up. Um, hope you're all enjoying the wonderful lunch. And uh, yeah, I'll get on with the, with the show part. Uh, told I, have, I probably have to go faster. Um, so, I wanted to, the next thing I wanted to, to, to share with you is just a real brief um, and hopefully simple overview of what we are doing in this project, how we're actually looking at heat waves. Um, and first of all, to start with my definition of heat wave, um, at this point in the study, we're, we're assuming a relative uh, threshold that's allowed to vary across space. Um, that threshold is the 95th percentile of summertime temperatures at that location. And that threshold is allowed to vary not just across space on a pixel by pixel basis, because we're dealing with gritty data here, but it's also allowed to vary through time. So we're allowing that 95th percentile threshold to be calculated for the month of May versus all Mays at that location. Uh, June versus all Junes, July, etc. So it's, it's, it's varying, it's changing seasonally within the summertime and it's also variable across space. Uh, we could play around with that, we could use the 99th percentile, we could go down to the 90th percentile. We have not incorporated minimum temperature in this yet, um, but we'd like to have, as I said, some of the other work I've done, I've got a bivariate threshold where I'm looking at not just it being hot in the daytime in terms of the maximum, but also an elevated minimum as well. Um, and this data set that we're working with, we're only playing around right now with maximum uh, daily temperature, but we could uh, incorporate other aspects of, of atmospheric variables. One thing that we 
we have envisioned doing in the near term is using uh, equivalent temperature. So we have a combination of uh, absolute air temperature with humidity there. Um, and trying to parse that out and actually look at events that may be high temperature, low humidity versus high temperature, high humidity events. We actually can separate those out as two different flavors of heat waves, if you wanted to call it like that. But right now, we're only, what I'm presenting to you today is only maximum temperature. Um, when we look at the data set, what we're essentially doing is creating a, a binary surface. So if you think of um, a gritty data set as, as um, kind of like a checkerboard or a chessboard, we're taking on a pixel by pixel basis, identifying whether that pixel is in heat wave or not according to that definition. And then we end up with this surface of pixels that are essentially zeros and ones, one being in a heat wave and zero not in a heat wave. And then we use a clustering algorithm to group those cells that are in heat wave together. So we're actually space, spatially accumulating those heat wave cells. And when we first began this project, we were thinking a lot about, well, what is the, the, the length distance of a heat wave? If I have a heat wave that's identified in this cell here, let's say it's over Tuscaloosa, and I have another cell that's disparate and is over in, let's say, Atlanta, is that the same heat wave in it? Now, typically, I would imagine that heat waves are happening at a synoptic scale. We've talked about these big high pressure areas, these blocks in the atmosphere. So typically, you would think of the synoptic scale as maybe around 1,000 kilometers as being the distance at which you might want to consider, OK, that's, that's one uh, behavior of the atmosphere at about 1,000 kilometer scale. But what we actually did was we looked at um, the statistical length at which there's no statistical similarity between a cell being in heat wave and another cell that's, that's, that's further away being in heat wave. So we're actually allowing the distance at which we do our clustering to vary across space and to vary regionally. And I know that's a little bit complicated to get your head around maybe, but I'm going to show you a conceptual uh, diagram in just a second. Um, and we're also assuming with our definition that a heat wave has to last for at least three days. Um, so we've got some persistence to it. Um, and we're also kind of interestingly, we have this uh, you know, problem of, okay, let's say we have a heat wave event that happens for three days, let's, let's say it's five days, and then it goes away, but then it comes back again. What is the number of days that we count as separating two events as unique, uh, as separate? So what we did was went to the epidemiological literature and there's been studies that have done that say if you have a heat wave today, you have hospital admissions, you have an excess mortality increase, maybe the next day, the next day, the next day. But once you get more than four days out, you don't see any increase in hospitalizations. So that's what we've used as separation. So if I am tracking a heat wave that disappears for one day, two days, three days, but then comes back, then it's considered to be the same event, if you get what I'm saying. We have to define that independence criteria between, between the events. And as we look at this methodology, there's some basic kind of geometrical concepts, shape concepts, that, that these words that I might use. The first one is a, a convex hull. And a convex hull is essentially drawing a polygon, the smallest polygon you can, around the heat wave. Right, so as tight as possible, getting the heat wave. You could uh, imagine that we do a sort of similar thing with a hurricane. Where is the extent of gale force winds extending out from the center of that hurricane? We're drawing a polygon around it to define that's where the hurricane is. Right, so that's what we're doing for the heat wave, the convex hull. We can think about several basic ideas about that. If we've got a, a corral, a fence around our heat wave, we can think about the perimeter of that, how, how, how far you have to walk around the thing. When you think about the area of it that we have in heat wave, um, and then we've also got this idea of, of clusters. So not just the clustering that we're doing to define the heat wave extent in the first place, but actually looking within the heat wave. And this gets to this idea of um, fragmentation, whether something is homogeneous or whether it is fragmented in terms of heat within that bounding convex hull. Um, and then we've got this idea of, of solid area, the area that is in heat wave within the extent of the heat wave. <coughs> so as we're tracking this daily, we're drawing our convex hull every day around the heat wave. And we assume that a heat wave 
can move through space. It can change its parameters on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're tracking it based on spatial overlap. So if I have a heat wave that's covering most of Alabama, and then the next day it starts to move into Georgia, as long as there's still some of the heat wave still overlapping with where it was the day before, that's still the same event. It's just moving. It's moving in the west to east circulation of the atmosphere. And as we're tracking it, we're tracking daily the area of the heat wave. Um, we can calculate the area that's in the convex hull. We can also look at just the solid area of heat. So the number of one cells we have versus zero cells inside of the rounded convex hull. We're also calculating the, the mean magnitude. So we're taking every single grid cell that's in heat wave within our bounding convex hull area and we're taking the average heat above the threshold so we're getting some idea of how hot that heat wave is right across space um, and then we're looking at frequency and duration but because we're tracking these things daily and we're doing it through the entire summer time we know how many have happened right we know exactly how long they've lasted for because we're tracking every single event daily and then we're also calculating this connectivity index um, NC is the number of clusters and NP is the number of positive for cells that are in heat wave. And it's a, it's a simple, relatively simple equation that's been used to look at precipitation events, to try to look at the uh, uh, clustering or fragmentation and precipitation events that are happening. So we, we've borrowed it for looking at heat. And so to give you an example of this, I know that was quite a bit of you know, gobbledygook, but this is, this is an example for, for the southern region of uh, NOAA's definition of, of the United States, the south includes the east states, right? not the south east of the And this is for uh, <coughs> July of 2012, when we had a really bad heat wave here. And so a heat wave has just appeared, and we've drawn a bold convex hull around it that is containing every grid cell that's in that heat wave. Yeah? And we can calculate all our metrics, we can calculate the magnitude, we can calculate the perimeter, we can calculate the area. And we're also now giving that unique identifier number, this is wave, let's say, 1A, and we continue to track it daily and see how it's evolving. And so we go to the next day, and the heat wave has gotten bigger. And it's increased in its spatial extent, it's increased its magnitude, and now we're also picking out other cells that are starting to pop out, and those of you in small areas, but we're picking out cells of heat throughout the broader region here, and we're extending our convex hull to capture them because they're within the critical distance of which we still consider it to be the same event. And we continue to track it to the next day, it gets bigger again, and the next day, and the next day, and so on. And then eventually, it starts to dissipate, so we're tracking how it, it, it disappears from the landscape as well. Right? And over each of these days, we're calculating all of these metrics, so we're building up a database of all this individual event. And again, that is one event because it spatially overlaps with each previous day. It's possible in this methodology for a heat wave to fragment totally, and then we would give them each different identified number, but they would still be historically linked back to the grid cells. What's the uh, resolution of your grid cells? About four kilometers. Four. Yeah. <coughs> so, go by your definition real quick. Yeah. The, the areas that are, say, are in all five, six of those polygons, um, are those weighted? More heavily in your, def in your definition, I can't remember. So, so like RD Oklahoma, for example. Yeah, so everywhere that's colored on here is it considered to be over the threshold that's it's in the heat wave. And the convex hull is, is, is containing every cell that is in the heat wave. So in the end, for this particular event, you're, like you said, the smallest possible shape, but will it ultimately include that entire, all of those areas that are affected? I mean, will it be the uh, like all of, like if you draw your perimeter from west all the way from west Texas to Mississippi in the end. Um, well, it's it's on a day by day basis, right? So I mean, here we're going all the way from from west Texas all the way, you know, basically to the eastern <coughs> extent because it has been very large. And then on the last day, no, it's I mean the convex hull is shrinking. Right? So each day. We're keeping track of all of these things. So at some point in the event, we reach a maximum of size, of, of area, of perimeter, and then we watch how that's going to shrink that thing. Okay. Yeah, so it's truly a daily tracking of, of the event. 
So just to note, the one thing we are doing, and this is, you're going to hear more about it here shortly, is we're taking where all of these have overlapped to talk about reoccurrences for these, like the same places where are they having these experiences over and over and over again. So maybe that's coming at what you were mentioning? Yeah. Was, to talk about like a final extent or a final extent of impact. It looked in that case like Northeast Oklahoma was impacted a lot more than yeah. South Texas, for example. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, and what we're hoping to do is as you build on this like reoccurrence, it's like, okay, is it Oklahoma consistently more often, get, or is it is it Mississippi that's most consistently okay. more often getting? So you do kind of track that. We're, we're in the process of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly a database. I mean, we're not just tracking this and then you know, chucking it out the window. We're tracking every single day and storing it in a, in a geospatial database. So we have the coordinates of where the heat was every single day. Right, we can we can start to build up this database and say, okay, well this place tends to get impacted more. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> and this also allows us to answer really basic questions that you may very well have thought, like you probably already knew the answer to this kind of common sense stuff. But here we've got maximum magnitude of the event, so how hot it gets on its hottest day of the heat wave versus heat wave area, the largest event it comes. And we see this really strong positive relationship between heat waves being high magnitude and also going over a larger spatial extent. So bigger events are also higher magnitude events. Right? So they're impacting more people with a larger or more intense amount of heat. We also can look at it in terms of heat wave duration. How many days does the event last for versus the size of the event? And larger events tend to last for more days. Right? So we're answering these kind of really basic and kind of simple questions, but no one really said, well, yeah, larger heat waves always more severe, or larger heat waves always longer lasting. Yeah. And over what time period is this? This is 1981 through 2018. So it's daily data, um, and this is for the entire continent of the United States. And then also, we can do the same for other metrics too. So heat wave connectivity, that's that index where um, one is highly connected and, and zero is very, very fragmented. So we tend to find here that larger events are more homogeneous, right? They're less fragmented uh, across space, which is kind of interesting. So there's been a lot of work done on heat waves in the United States. Uh, obviously, we're, we're you know, not, not disputing that here. Um, here, what we've done is regionally look at kind of standard metrics that a climate type person like me might be considering. So this is looking at heat wave frequency. How many heat waves happen in that season, in that annual uh, time step? And really, there's you know, in the literature, in in my field, um, we know that the average temperatures have increased steadily across the continental United States, but we haven't seen a a concordant <coughs> increase in extreme temperatures like heat waves. And it's kind of annoying as it's kind of unusual, right? We, you know, you hear a lot of people say that heat waves are increasing frequency, increasing magnitude, increasing duration, heat waves are getting worse. But we're not seeing that in the data. Uh, so it's been kind of perplexing. Some regions a little bit more so than others. Some places do pop out a bit more. But across the continent of the United States as a whole, you'd be forgiven for asking the question, where is the heat? Right? We, just don't, we just don't see it. So this is looking at heat wave frequency in all of these regions across the continental United States, and none of these have a significant upward trend. There's no trend in any of them. So none of these regions from 1981 through the end of 2018 have seen an upward trend in the number of heat waves that are happening in each one of these summer times. But what the, what the heck's going on? We can also look at magnitude, and once one region here, the southwest, it's showing a pretty significant upward trend in the magnitude of events that are happening. But the other eight regions, no, no significant trend in magnitude of events. We do the same for duration. We see a little bit of an upward trend in the southwest and also the southern region. But the other seven, no, we're not seeing an increasing trend in that aspect of heat waves either. What about aerial extent, the size of heat waves, what we're specifically looking at in this study. Four of the regions out of nine, yes, we're seeing that heat waves are becoming larger when they happen. But not even the path, right? You know, we're not seeing a huge change in aerial extent. So you can still ask yourself the question, where the heck's the heat? Um, and so 
you know, I've been thinking about this for a few years, and I think that part of the problem is that we're not seeing trends in these things, is we're looking individually at these individual characteristics of events. Right? Frequency does not capture everything about a heat wave. Magnitude does not capture everything about heat wave duration, aerial extent, it's not capturing everything. So a lot of heat wave studies have tried to apply indices, um, tried to look at just trends like this and these different parameters, but they're not finding anything. And I think the reason they're not finding anything is because we need something that captures all of these things together. And we need something that looks at all aspects of heat simultaneously. So what we've come up with is a new index another index for heat waves. We call this the Heat Severity and Coverage Index, or HSCI. And it's kind of it's conceptually similar to the US Drought Monitors Index that they have for um, uh, droughts across the United States. And basically what it is is a combination of all aspects of heat that we're looking at. And because we're conceptualizing heat waves in the way we are, because we're tracking them daily using this clustering algorithm and these definitions of scale, that people haven't used before, we're able to come up with an index like this that's pretty simple. We're just taking the sum of the magnitude of events and we're multiplying it by the area. And because we're tracking all of these things daily, we're capturing duration, we're capturing frequency within that, right? Because we're capturing every single event as it's happening on a daily basis. So that index allows us to say something about the real total amount of heat that's happening across a landscape each summertime. Because right? we're capturing every possible aspect of heat wave events as we go through the days of the summertime. And when we do this regionally, we then start to see that a lot more regions have a significant upward trend in total heat wave burden that's happening on the landscape. When we combine frequency with magnitude, with duration, with aerial extent, then we start to see trends. You know, so previously, yeah, we didn't see a trend in frequency, but just because there aren't more of them happening doesn't mean that the ones that are happening aren't larger or aren't lasting for a longer duration. There's so many different ways you could twiddle those knobs. And this is the first way through applying this new method that we can actually get at what is the total severity and coverage of heat waves across the continent of the United States. So for all of these regions, with the possible exception of the southeast where we are, we see a pretty steady upward trend in this new index that we've created. We can also do this for the continental United States as a whole, and we see really significant upward trend in this index of total severity and coverage of heat waves. It's interesting when we look at this, there's a lot of interannual variability right about this trend. And for example, 1988 is coming out as a big heat wave year. We've got 2003, we've got 2012. So this index is really picking up those high magnitude years where we had a lot of heat wave activity. And again, here, we're combining all of the aspects of frequency, magnitude, duration, and extent into one simple, relatively simple index. So the last breakout thing that I would like for you to do is to think about what heat wave metrics are important to you, right? Whether it's these ideas of frequency, magnitude, duration, or aerial extent, whether it's the connectivity within the heat wave itself, whether it's just the magnitude that you're more interested in, what is important for you in your personal or professional setting, what do you really think is the thing that we should be looking at with heat waves, or is it this new index that's some sort of combination of all of these things? Um, to get at the actual burden on the, on the total landscape. Um, so think about these things, is it important how hot it gets? Is it important how long the heat wave lasts for? Are both of those things important? Is the size of the area really important to you? Is the population, again, that's being affected? Presumably a larger heat wave would affect more population, but is, what is important, what is really important to you in terms of heat wave characteristics? Who wants to share? <coughs> Yeah. So, um, I've written down the vulnerability of the population. I've written down the vulnerability of the population. Yeah, it's taking into account everything. Oh, everything. Yeah. There's a large area without power after hurricanes and stuff like that. How abnormal of a heat wave is it? Like, is it a low end? Is it higher end? And also, duration. Everybody's opinion is important in this. Bueller, Bueller. 
<laughs> I'm get that reference. <laughs> Sadly, thing is my students don't know you. No. They wouldn't. Um, such a good thing. <coughs> my, my initial thoughts were um, for duration being more important, but then we, we talked about in our group that um, it occurred to me uh, that uh, intensity mm -hmm. can be, you know, I mean, it's equally important. Uh, the duration, um, a lot of the impacts are felt at the beginning. You, you described it a lot better um, when you were talking about it, but as far as the duration, the, uh, the impacts kind of tail off with time as people get more conditioned. We have like the, the kind of the harvesting effects. So, uh, so, so I kind of ultimately came up with a combination of duration and intensity as far as uh, what's what's critical. Um, and I thought that was who said the vulnerability for um, in terms of people that were hit by hurricanes. Um, yeah, yeah, I that was said a, vulnerability of, pop of the population, but it would be like you know if there is a large area without power. That's that's a great point because I think about I remember like when Katrina came through, I, you know, powers out and everything. It was like miserably hot. Um, yeah, a heat wave right after. Yeah. So that, that's that's a really good point. But anyway, great, thanks. And it put more people vulnerable because more people were displaced from their homes and yeah, trying absolutely. to. You know, right. find adequate housing, etc. You're outdoors a lot. And outdoors, yeah. trying to make repairs. Right. Yeah, I mean, there was a huge displacement of people after Katrina. People that would normally be vulnerable. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um, just, I, oh, I don't, do I have to use that? Maybe. You don't uh, have to. The online people. Oh, the online people. Well, of course. We, we, we certainly don't want them to miss it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think, and I'm sorry, I, I left the room, but certainly I think people have talked about <coughs> the number of vulnerable people affected, and that seems more important to me than, you know, a geographical size of an area. But I also would like you to consider thinking about this as a real social determinant of health. You know, we talk about lack of transportation, lack of housing, but I think this would have, you know, application there, too. Yeah. And we're about to expand on that probably here in a second. Okay. So well, good. we're going into that area. <laughs> Anybody else want to add? So this isn't maybe directly about the heat waves themselves, but I'd be interested in, in looking at some correlations or possible correlations with uh, what I would generally call impacts on human systems. So, you know, economics, systems, obviously health, transportation, tourism, entertainment industries, especially because it's summer often uh, when this kind of thing is occurring, right, that, that a lot of areas depend on entertainment, tourism kinds of stuff. So I was trying to just briefly figure out what we might look at, but things like cancellation or changing of public events and um, obviously ER visits and some other kinds of, in develop some indices of like that could be tied back to this to show kind of where the size of it, in a way, might change based on human system interaction. Yeah. That's kind of a perfect <coughs> segue almost. Oh, look. <laughs> Happy to help. Let's segue then, then. So finish up what you're writing up and send them this way again while she gets started. I forgot both, so. Catch up. <laughs> 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 oh no, not again. Oh, keyboard isn't working. What? <laughs> 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 Is it overheated? <laughs> it might be yeah, overheated. Yeah, maybe, yeah. We couldn't take it anymore. That's still working. How in the world? I have no idea. Yeah, so just, you know, a, a last slide for me before we get into much more interesting stuff from Aaron. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, 
just, uh, you know, this, this is following on from previous work and, you know, ourselves and, and other people across, researchers across the U.S. have found fairly significant increases in the total area of heat that's uh, been impacted, that, you know, there's significant trends in that. But this really, our study is the first to bring everything together in terms of not just looking at it spatially, but thinking about it daily and the evolution of heat and uh, to bring, bring together the frequency, the duration, the magnitude, and all of these other things that we've talked about. So um, when we do that, we find this really substantial increase in, in the heat wave bourbon, as I like to call it, uh, across the US. We're seeing these really big increases, and I think this really helps us answer the question, at least climatologically, where has the heat gone? Well, it hasn't really gone anywhere. We, we do actually see it, depends on how you look at it. Um, and really, you know, we're particularly excited about this, not just because of what we're talking about here today, but we're particularly excited about trying to look at what geophysical variables are, are impacting this, what is causing these changes that we're seeing, and, and then again, this gets at our ability to provide you folks with a seasonal forecast. Is there any way that we can predict? Is it more likely that we're going to get a big, higher magnitude, longer-lasting event this summertime because of what we see going on with soil moisture or atmospheric conditions or teleconnections to El Nino or NEO or whatever? Um, so that's, that's what particularly excites, excites me about this. Um, and also thinking about how, you know, the issue broader, broader term, the issue of climate change may be, may be playing in here. But really, you know, what, the whole reason I do my research on, ex on, on extreme uh, weather events and, and extremes in climate is, is because it always has a human impact. It's those extreme events that are the things that kill people. Um, and, and, you know, talking about long-term trends or, or changes in statistical distributions and these sorts of things we've looked at it all you know pales in comparison to the actual effect that these events have on people and that's what I've really appreciated talking to you all about here. Um, it's really been enlightening. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's helped me out a huge amount. So I'm just really thankful that, that you were all here. I really appreciate that. Um, and you know and, and thanks for suffering through listening to my Scottish accent and um, <laughs> I hope you, hope you somewhat enjoyed that. My students enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to pass it over to Erin, and we're going to be doing the same sort of thing. We're going to have more breakout activities, and uh, but we're going to change direction just slightly, and uh, I will I will still be around in case you have a burning burning question. It's a hot question. Hot question. It's a hot topic. Yeah. We have officially become old people with these jokes. We went to grad school together. And we were joking because I've been staying with him the last couple nights. And like, what happened to us from grad school? We didn't go out at all. We we, I was, like, I we was, make corny jokes yeah, now. I was tired last night. It was eight o'clock. I, I was think like, I'm in <laughs> 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 like grad school days are really far behind us now. Something, so something terrible has happened. Yeah, yeah. We've become old. That's what's happened. Okay. So thank you everybody for um, staying and listening. Um, so over the next hour and a half or so, um, I do have quite a few, or not quite a few, a few discussion points similar to David. <laughs> we're going to go and do a couple different activities. Um, I'll start by saying when uh, we were sitting at a conference a few years ago, and David threw out this idea of fragmentation. And by training, I'm an ecologist, an environmental scientist, but I do have a large climate background as well. And it was one of those, I've done a lot of idea of work on landscape fragmentation and with human as humans change the landscape and when he said it it was one of those where I was like okay let's yeah maybe that that might be feasible to think about and it wasn't until maybe a few hours later where I like started to like write down some ideas and say okay this is valuable this is actually there's a lot of um, good work that could come out of this in terms of not just seasonal forecasts but actually gauging vulnerability across landscapes as well. So um, coming up with the idea, like for instance, hurricanes in coastal areas, does that make you more vulnerable to these heat wave events or populated areas, you know, rural versus urban settings? Um, so, how do I change this? Okay. Um, so, we started this project, instead said, about two years ago, really before we had kind of jumped on the NSF bandwagon, with kind of a simple approach to we use a very traditional tool set called FragStats that it was the bane of my grad school days. And we came up with uh, some interesting results. But 
what we never did is we had we didn't have the landscape contextualization. So when we wrote the grant, David had a new idea for ways to calculate the indices that he showed you. <coughs> but it also became this idea of what if we think about ecohydrology? What if we think about soil moisture? What if we think about land use? What if we think about population and land cover? And we pull into it. So we've really been jumping off of this idea for a few years now, <coughs> but going into a much broader area now. So before I go into too much depth, the first thing, because I think it's the perfect segue for what the last question was, we've talked a lot about human health and age uh, and demographics that were, say, vulnerable to these heat wave events. But other than human health, if in the groups you guys could come up with five to seven environmental, social, and economic impacts of heat waves. And so, like I said, five to seven for each, if, if, if you can, for each of those categories. And so we're interested to know if what played out earlier, or maybe we have a new idea that comes out. So we do want this to be a little bit of a, one of the faster questions, so I think we're going to do five minutes for this one. Um, and then we'll talk about them in a group again, okay? So other than human health, what are, how, does, and, uh, hum, how do heat waves impact the environment, social development, livelihoods, and economics? Yeah. We've said a few of them already that were good ones. So. We've uh, talked about uh, possible impact socially on things like public events, like parades and, and public those events of would definitely be popular in the summer. And I think when when we look through the literature and I think about these public events too, it's like when you think about either delaying or postponing or canceling these events, and it's, somebody says it's just heat, like it's just hot. But you don't imagine like little kids sitting out and watching a parade for hours on end in the heat. So or it's one of those that it's much easier to say, yep. get out of the way of a hurricane. I mean, I know that's even difficult sometimes, but heat is like it's kind of an unseen thing a lot of the, and a lot of times. Great. Yes. That just made me think of so this past football season was pretty um, yeah. mm -hmm. it was a pretty big deal here because <coughs> there was at least one person that died mm -hmm. at, at the stadium. Um, oh my and so that to me is something like I, didn't know that. I can't imagine them ever canceling a game because of the heat. Absolutely. But you know, thinking about if it's going to start lasting longer, if the seasonality is changing, that can have huge implications. Well, and to give you that, some ideas, like so, at the University of Florida, the we had no games the first half of the season that started before five o'clock. That was the new rule, and it was like the first games we always had were noon games for so long, and it was miserable out there, noon in Florida, you know. We were always just like dripping, so that's the that's the rule to kind of in the future that is the same rule. They're going for the same rule next year as well. So there are some ways, but it, it it takes a long time to change those rules, right, and to change that understanding. I know there was actually a huge rebellion about the changing to five o'clock games. Yeah, because you miss your happy hour at the end. You're like the post when celebration changes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, how about this group? Are some of our social changes? I'll give more time to tell again. Right. That's actually all of that. We need to support the after five. Okay. But we also have the outdoor events, and you know, we're talking about how people have actually changed, you know, schedule, change their scheduling, and like maybe not going to an event because of the time of year. And then also on hydrologic recreation. We're going to get back to that in just a minute, so I'm glad we touched on that one. But the idea of hydrology and what's changing and, and how it impacts then tourism and recreation is, is a big idea. Yes. We talked a lot about the same, the, the increased crime rate is a big one we talked about. But, uh, increased crime? Absolutely. You had a good point about um, more people, people are more active at night. Um, you, want to explain, you might explain it better. Yeah, right? so, Typically, in the summertime, your thefts and your burglaries increase because they, you know, if, if you know, it's all it is, if they're unemployed or not working, they typically stay in during the day when it's hot. Right. They get out two or three o'clock in the morning, and that's when a lot of times your commercial burglaries, your your, your vehicle break-ins occur. So a very specific type of crime rate increase. I mean, we we went from the very violent to yeah, this well, is and that's very too because with alcohol. You know, consumption typically will increase in the summer it's around gatherings and lakes and, and all that, and, and uh, um, you'll get more, you know, disorderly conducts, fights, that kind of thing. Domestics. Yeah. Mental well being. Mental well being does change. Yeah. All right, so what about our economic impacts? 
of heat waves. Those are, there's a lot that could be said for the economic impacts, but do we want to start in the back again? Well, so almost everything we mentioned, right, it's one way or another, has an economic um, impact. Right. We talked about things like food prices, or specific food prices yes. potentially rising. Um, I, I wondered about uh, road work and construction perhaps having to halt, which always adds money to the cost of any um, project. Um, home visits for um, vulnerable populations when the heat gets to a certain point and cooling centers have to be open. There's some expense tied to that as well as the, the wellness checks um, right. that have to go on for certain populations. Yeah, I mean, there is not just talking in the literature about like heat and the rate of hospitalization, but the cost of ho hospitalization. We've, we've seen you know relationships in that regard as well. And I think it's going back to this idea: more staff is needed, more you know, more beds, more supplies is going in. So it's definitely in the in, in the costly side of it. All right, our group here. What about our economic side? We had a loss of productivity, uh, an increase in project timelines. That kind of cost more money. The cost of materials and planes not being able to take off. Oh, like transportation. transportation, huge impacts. I lived in Arizona for a number of years, and Phoenix obviously was our biggest airport. And in the summer, it was like I would rather drive than plan a trip out of PHX because <laughs> there was a good chance, given how hot it was, we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> So, and it's, and it's one of those, we, uh, there's been numerous occasions I've boarded a plane and they're going to be like, just, just go home, people. And then the flight's been canceled because it's too hot to fly and to take off. So. Isn't there some truth to in the times of days you even fill up your car with heat? I mean, there's times, so not really so much in the Phoenix area. I had heard some of the things about evening. Yeah, morning or, being, or evening just in terms of, um, like the, the cooling rate, like what structures are put in place, essentially. <clears throat> but I haven't seen that so much, and I haven't seen it in the literature either. All right, how about our group over here? Uh, we're talking about the road issues, yeah. possible buckling roads. Is that right, Greg? Yeah. And uh, um, postponed outdoor events can have a huge big, economic impact. You're kind of talking about that. Yeah. Um, air quality. Um, I don't know if that's, that's more of an environmental, I guess. Yeah, but it can have, obviously, the economic impacts as well, right? Kind of looking back to the events and recreation and tourism. Yeah. So they, and you're right in saying that they're all interconnected with the economic side of things. <coughs> uh, so a few things that I was thinking about, too, is, I mean, we could link back to agriculture and changes and, and loss of crops or loss of or changing of planting routines and jobs associated with those types of work. And if there's changes there, how that can impact the economic side of things. So we touched on a lot of really interesting subjects with this. And um, I put this in here kind of midway in because I said, anybody, um, I've been, done my introduction already, but um, just in case people don't really know how to contact me, here's my information. But also to say, my part of the project is actually very different than David's part. So I'm coming in on phase two of this project, and really it's the phase that's just not getting ready to start. So the questions I'm going to talk to you guys about these blobs, these heat wave polygons he's shown you, are going to be a little different than saying what is a heat wave, which are important questions or what variables are impacted. We're going to actually be talking more about the landscape, what you've seen as impacts, and so forth. <coughs> and that's an elephant skull. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, and the reason it's up there is a lot of my work has been across uh, sub-Saharan Africa and looking at temperature, mostly about water rates and water utilization, water scarcity, um, so that and, and how it impacts then native vegetation as well. So this is actually in Namibia, and this picture is one that I use in a lot of slides because this was in an epic drought here. Here and um, they actually had to go through and do some intentional animal kills because they couldn't support the animal populations with the water levels that were available. Um, so this was at one of the border crossings where, I mean, we have buffalo, chimpanzees, elephants, kudu, impala. I mean, they, they were not um, picky because they couldn't be. In order to sustain a population for the long term, they had to do some culling given the water and temperature issues. All right, so like I said, my part of the project is a little bit different. I'm gonna come in and take this heat wave data, this heat wave blobs that we've been calling them, 
and look at how they impact land use, land cover, and ecohydrology. And so by ecohydrology, I'm mostly focusing on soil moisture, uh, rates of evapotranspiration, that, that basic human environment connection, right? So how changes in soil moisture impact changes in agriculture, and it's related to heat wave occurrence. So it's a multi-tiered way that we're looking at ecohydrology, and it includes runoff as well. A lot of my work in the past has been on vegetation and climate impacts to vegetation. Um, so thinking about when do we lose native forests or when do we lose native vegetation? What is coming back in base to species is a big thing that I do in terms of understanding temperature and, pre and uh, precipitation changes and how it impacts the landscape. So things about what's happening to the health of crops globally or the health of pastures or the loss of native vegetation and what it's becoming, all resulting from temperature and precipitation changes globally. So one thing I want to think about is we're going to talk a lot about vulnerability, and we're going to talk a lot about these forecasts that David's mentioned. And one thing I don't want us to focus on so much right now is just the age factor. I mean, we've, we've said a few times now that the vulnerable groups to, to extreme heat, to heat waves, young, pregnant, elderly, we're gonna go a little bit beyond that now and think about environmental health, landscape health, economic health, um, resulting from these heat wave events. And so what we're gonna be doing throughout this is a lot more like questions. You guys will get a few, just a few minutes, and you're gonna be a lot quicker um, out for all but one. And then we're gonna speed back and I'm gonna show you a little bit about what we're doing and how we're incorporating that. So we have a few more questions in this round of um, slides than we had in the first round earlier today. So just to let you guys know, all the slides, I saw a few people taking pictures of slides earlier. We can make those available to the group. Whoever wants them, you guys are welcome to, um, to have them. All right, so the first one, and we're actually going to do this as a group. Originally, it was going to be the same. You're going to break up into your groups, but Jake and I talked about it here shortly, and so we decided to change up this question. So how does land use, so different types of land uses or land cover, different types of vegetation, water, wetlands, for instance. How, what, what of those types are vulnerable to heat waves and how? And so we're gonna make a list here on the board. I'm gonna be your scribe. I have terrible handwriting, I'm really sorry. Just be ready. <laughs> so yes. The first thing that pops in my head, uh, Jake had mentioned the Dust Bowl era, uh, mismanagement of the land. Um, there was a... So that was more like the ag management side yeah I guess that so the lack of crop growth now some of that was climate related too because the rainfall it was definitely climate related yeah uh, it was a combination of things so not um, just like um, total crop loss yeah um, that so reduces the evapotranspiration mm -hmm. change in evapotranspiration we definitely saw that. The, uh, I would say urban area, increased urban areas. Um, you know, you've got more asphalt uh, absorbing heat. Okay. So urban heat islands is what we'll call that one. Okay, so urban, ag, other land covers or land uses that we've seen. Well, you have like um, dams and, and for rivers to, for, for power or, or recreation use. So our, I'm going to say like our aquatic systems, right? So thinking about shrinking lake levels or in flood, I mean, we can talk about floods, that's the converse, but uh, so levels, infrastructure that has to go into place to one of the big things we see up in Michigan in times of weird temperature and precipitation patterns is um, when the lakes are drawing down, then there's a loss of the shoreline when there's like when there isn't a weather event coming back in. So they're going back and doing a bunch of beach neutrification or uh, they're adding sand to the beach. So there's a huge cost to the communities when these events happen. So it's not just, say, the aquatic system losing the water, it's the cost that people incur, the <coughs> communities incur as a result of it as well. 
All right, so urban, uh, aquatic, agriculture. What about some of like our vegetation systems, like forested systems or grasslands? Um, any, any ideas about how they're susceptible to heat waves or are impacted by heat waves? Is vanishing wetlands part of that? I would definitely put vanishing wetlands in here. This stuff one goes right well in here. Um, And what did you say about the well, when you asked that question, I mean, like, I grew up on a farm, the rain and the water, if you have tons of heat, it all dies. Yeah. And I mean, timber, you know, is the same way that that whole industry, if you don't have hydration, the trees and grass don't Work. Exactly. And not only do they grow, but and when we think about our native vegetation, like that map I showed earlier, what is coming back in those systems afterwards, typically we're seeing invasives are much more dominant than our local ve native vegetation. So that's when you're getting things that are less biologically productive or less um, just considered of value to the system. Um, so definitely that's how uh, you would see death of the system. You'd also see vulnerability to say wildfires, we already mentioned that. Um, one thing we've seen a lot in the Southwest is a loss of uh, the fauna. So for instance, I worked, like I said, I worked in Arizona for a number of years, and we are losing our sagebrush to, to drought events and to extreme heat events. And there is a special type of bird that's now on an endangered species list called the sage grouse, and it only lives in sagebrush. So we're seeing not just this loss of vegetation, um, and this die-off of vegetation, but we're seeing its impact on the fauna as well. Yeah. With the wet, with the wetlands, of course, that if you have a drought and, and heat, that could hurt marsh uh, plants, marsh, um, and that could hurt uh, and cause more erosion, coastal erosion. Definitely. Especially when I know grown up along the Louisiana coast. Absolutely. That's a That's marsh a huge issue. Yeah, because you're, you're destabilizing the systems when you lose those, and that's why we lose a lot of the beaches as well in those in those times, so that's absolutely spot on. Anything else? I can't think of anything that's more vulnerable to, than ice cover, ice caps, and things like that. Ice cover is definitely one, so, um, so we'll call that our tundra systems. The glaciers in here, uh, I mean, that kind of, kind of ties in. It does. So uh, one thing I would say too is, I know we, we mentioned urban systems here. I would also put rural systems into these as well because they're gonna see some different impacts. But that's, a, it's a pretty sensitive list, right? It's something that we touch on every single day or we, we see every single day or we're impacted by every single day. If you think of anything else throughout the course of the rest of today, feel free to come up and write it on the list here. All right. So one thing I wanted to focus on is, I know this is a figure that David showed earlier, but this is that idea of urban heat islands. I'm not necessarily focusing on that portion on it. I'm focusing kind of on the back end. When we have these heat wave events, what is happening to the landscape? An urban heat island says, all right, when you build an urban area, you're, you can, uh, there's, uh, it's gonna be hotter in that area compared to rural landscapes. I'm looking at it conversely. Once it's really hot and we have these heat wave events, what is happening to the landscape? And so it's a few things, I mean, we mentioned some of these here, um, but for instance, talking about changes in wildfire events, that's, we can really link that back to Australia right now, is probably a great example. Um, we can also see, we've seen tree growth itself, so in heat wave events, even when there is enough, say, soil moisture for growth, we're actually seeing a decreased uh, growth rate in native vegetation um, across the U.S. We are seeing impacts on these forests as well in Europe. We're seeing, again, like we mentioned, the fauna over here and its impacts from extreme heat. Wetlands, that was mentioned as well, that's really common in the news. And then our grassland systems. And the grassland systems meaning in the susceptibility to fire, the susceptibility to the desertification of these systems as well. All right, so this next question, you guys are gonna work on in your groups. So, pretty simple, heat waves have impacted blank in my community. We've thrown out ideas of things that could be impacted, 
We want to know how it has impacted your community, things you have physically seen. And then I want you guys to rank them from the most severe to the least severe. So we're going to come around with some of these big pieces of paper, and you guys are going to have 10 minutes to do this section, so it's going to be a little quick. Um, and then we'll put them up and we'll talk about uh, the rankings and what, how they, each group is different. I know we have people from Florida, Mississippi, you know, here in Alabama, I almost said Michigan, um, and so I want to see how those lists differ. So actually what you've experienced. And if you guys disagree on your ranking, feel free to put a little asterisk there saying, you know, maybe you thought this was the number one issue in your community, but you, you had a different idea. Our group three, do you mind talking a little bit about what you, you wrote up? Yeah. Um, do you need me to stand up there? I think you're fine. We can. Okay. Uh, um, so our, you see our rankings there. Uh, some of these, are, you know, these are definitely interchangeable, but increased wildfire threat. I think I've, I heard some other folks talking mm -hmm. about that for sure. More, more susceptibility. Um, just the general heat-related illnesses, of course. Um, one thing that was really, I thought, was pretty profound. And Greg here was talking about it, but the, I didn't really think about until now. The, the water supply of, um, back in some of our greater droughts, at least, uh, and, and those were accompanied by heat waves, where they usually are here in, in the south. Uh, the lakes tended to, the reservoirs tended to really dry up. Um, some of those serve as water supplies, um, but also re you know, recreation, recreational areas that can, that's severely impacted a lot of times with heat waves. Um, and then just the general utility bill increases, um, and uh, heat, of course heat related illness, I didn't, I don't know if I said that yet, but, uh, and also uh, you know, longer duration seasons. Maybe there's some perception. I don't. I know we talked some about that. You, you talk, uh, there's definitely <coughs> perception. It seems, like, especially after this past fall, that you know we were we really had a late heat wave uh, going into October. Um, it wasn't. Maybe that's been a more of a trend. So. No, it wasn't. That's that's about it. Okay. So just really quickly to comment on the utility bill side of things and the water supply kind of in tandem, and it's it's obviously not here in the U.S. but um, I spent last summer in South Africa and Cape Town this year, because of extreme heat and long duration heat events, um, they got to what they called, or they were on the precipice of day zero. So the day when literally all the taps were going to be turned off. There was going to be no running water in a wow. major metropolitan area. They did not get to that point. They became, they got within, uh, I think they said two weeks of it. Um, and then the rain, rain season started. They don't use groundwater. They only use surficial water for so that was one of the issues. Um, so the reservoir needed to be refilled with rainwater. Um, but what also happened subsequently is not only did they put in a huge number of programs for water conservation strategies, but the cost of water just skyrocketed yeah. even after they got away from day zero. So it's something to think about. And I mean, I've not seen an example of that here in the US, but since then, and I'll get to you in a second, Jake, but since then, uh, a very similar thing has happened in uh, two cities in India, <coughs> same exact thing, getting close to day zero, rates of water going up, and these are already areas where running water in the households is rare. Um, and then um, there's another um, in um, Bangladesh, there was another city as well that this happened to. So there's, we're setting up an unfortunate precedent for this, this, this kind of scary trend in terms of what's happening with utilities and extreme. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I worked at a station in Wichita Falls um, in 2013 and 2014, and this was just off the heels of the really bad drought in 2012 out in that region, and the they all get their water from area lakes, and they were all down to about 20, 15, 20 percent, and so you know nobody could water their yard, no restaurants were serving uh, water, like actual silverware, um, pools were shut down, all that kind of stuff, but what was concerning was is that with the water quality, they were going to start reusing some water from some you know not great places, mm -hmm. and I just I don't know what the end game was going to be for that. You know, luckily they're they're out of it now and lakes are back to being full, but you know that can very quickly become a huge compounding situation. Well, and, and so in the Cape Town area, they use brown water within agricultural settings. That was a switch over. The the biggest thing they did, which was um, very daunting to think is that they made a actually an online map and it showed 
every household how much water they were using. And if you were in the red, you were over the, your quota to use, and if you were in the green, you were fine. And they actually had campaigns that said, if your neighbor is in the red, go and harass them because they are the reason your tap is going to be turned off. And so it became like a neighborhood peer pressure event, essentially, to turn off. But they also did get down to, they limited water to 10 gallons per person per day, which that's about a one minute shower. To, well, like a two minute shower, I guess, in, the, I mean, there. So we're talking about, they were doing things so extreme, like when you did take a shower, you were collecting the water that was going down. It wasn't just running down and it was being reused in a garden to wash clothes, I mean, it was being all reused. So they had some very extreme water measures. Um, we spent a lot of time at the University of Cape Town when we were there, and this is gonna be a little disgusting. The toilets were allowed to flush once a day. So hold it was the key <laughs> theme for that one. But I mean, we had been in another university, Grahamstown, which is a few hours away from Cape Town, and they actually did, at, the, at their university, the taps were turned off. There was no running water for, a, for several weeks during that time. Okay, so group two, who wants to talk about your list? Because you guys have multiple clusters on your list. Yeah. Sorry, no, I'm, no, getting, no, I'm, I'm getting my groups confused. No worries. We are too. <laughs> so uh, for us, we really were kind of talking about quality of life. And really all of those have some quality of life aspect to them. Um, work schedules having to change because of the high heats. Um, increase in utilities, which have been discussed pretty, pretty much, and fire threats, which have all also been discussed. You know, all of those have an impact on the quality of life in, in an area. And that, that's not even to really mention the, the health aspects of this as well, which is also part of quality of life. Um, mental health, physical health, all of those things. Well, and linking back to David's secondary, um, you know, illnesses or deaths related to health, too, one of the things that we, can think about it as like with fires, for instance, like smoke, you know, and, and like instances of asthma, things that are not in some of these numbers that are in air quality, that the numbers that we're pulling from the CDC, but are definitely related to extreme heat events. All right, group one. Apparently, I can't go backwards because I can't remember numbers. Yeah, right. So we grouped ours in a couple different buckets, I'd say. So uh, health and air quality kind of grouped together. So in fact, there. And then from there, we went down to quality of life and tied that in with, of course, we're in Alabama football. Um, and sports as, and, and as a whole, you know, high school sports, uh, college sports, whatever. Uh, and then from there, the, the economical impacts, including the agricultural productivity that someone brought up earlier. And then the environmental impacts, so things like wildfires, droughts, fish kills, uh, those kind of things. So those are kind of the, the different groups that we put those into. Great. All right, anybody think that there's something major missing from this list that we should talk about quickly? I think it's pretty comprehensive with what we're, where we've been going. So if we look internationally, we go beyond um, just here in the U.S. I mean, this, this idea and understanding this public awareness of heat is just growing. And I mean, the World Cup, uh, obviously was huge this summer. We had somebody who mentioned they were in France. That was um, a, a very long persisting uh, heat wave event. Uh, here in the U.S., areas that are re re breaking records. Um, that's, what, almost a <laughs> regular occurrence in the news nowadays. Um, and just things like that. For instance, here up in Michigan, where I'm from, we had no snow until about a week before Christmas this year, a week and a half before Christmas. That was wow. incredibly rare for us. We usually have several inches of standing snow by that time. We're, we're at about 10 inches of standing snow now. So um, yeah, that's that that's one. Um, <laughs> uh, and then just talking about some of the things that have been in the news related to heat and this idea that it's, I guess the awareness is growing for it, but still it's not as common in, when you Google like, hurricane occurrences or impacts versus heat, is, we're still not, it's just not as well understood as um, some of our more extreme, well, our more well-known uh, extreme events. So when we first started this project, we actually kind of did this in a very different manner than what David showed you. And the reason we saw the legs on this, pro on this idea, the viability of this idea, was off of a really simple analysis, and it's these next two slides that I'm showing you. So what David did, he showed you your me the methodology we're currently using, 
But even though these are a little bit older results now, I still think they're very worth showing because they, they clearly show a different picture uh, than what had been previously seen in uh, the literature. And so what we did at first before we developed this index that was talked about, this blob index as I like to call it, is we took each one of these events and we looked at different durations. So if it was a three-day duration, a five-day, a seven-day duration event, and we looked at the area, the number of these patches, we didn't do our convex polygons. We treated each one as a separate event just to study what was going on with those individual events. And so what we found is that the number of these heat wave patches was increasing over time. And so what you're seeing, if it's class one, those are our more low severity, and these are our more extreme events um, down here. So we're going from 1950 to 2010. So not only were we getting more, more um, of these events, what we were seeing though is that the actual size of them is shrinking, which I think we both kind of scratched our heads at first when this came up and said, no, that doesn't seem right. But when you think about it, it's actually almost a, I don't want to say more daunting picture, but it's, it's, it's a, a more scary picture because what we're saying is there's more of these events. They're more scattered across the landscape, but they're smaller. So there's a lot more, it's more of the Swiss cheese effect, right? There's going to be a lot of them covering a lot of different areas, a lot of different landscapes, a lot of different populations, uh, ethnic differences, demography differences. It's going to become more extreme as we go through time, or what we've seen is more extreme through time. So one thing that we were hoping that you guys could do, and this is actually the big part of the, what we're doing this afternoon, <coughs> And it's this idea of bringing all of these things that we've done today, talking about the heat wave blob itself, talking about what it impacts, talking about the land cover that can be affected, talking about duration and different definitions, and putting it together on what we call a mind map. So I'm going to show you one quickly, but I don't want you to be uh, influenced by it, so you're just going to see like a flash and then it's going to go away. Um, so what we're talking about, this is what a mind map looks like. So it's this idea that you take multiple aspects, you link them together by different um, either variables that come into play when you're talking about them or you think about forecasting them or different things that are impacted by it. Don't remember that, you didn't see it. Um, so what we want you guys to do is mind map vulnerability to heat waves. All right, so just like the one I showed you, vulnerability will be in the middle, in the big circle in the middle of your board. But I want you to think about these things that you've been writing out, these land covers, your definitions, what we talked about, duration, and heat. And I want to see, it's going to look crazy. I know it's going to look crazy. Just be ready. I want you to do a map of the connectivity of those features. And I want you to map out the vulnerability of these. Thinking about populations, thinking about coastal versus urban versus rural and how vulnerability is mapped differently. Every place is going to look different mm -hmm. and this is an interesting exercise because it usually brings up how everything might be connected or we make up some connections sometimes. Too. So this one you're actually going to have 15 minutes for. This one is a lot more we can walk around and talk about it because I think that might help spark ideas or ways that these work. Um, again, we can do one flash if you missed it. I'm not going to put it up there too long. It's going to look something like that. <laughs> Don't look at too long. <laughs> All right. So vulnerability. You're going to map vulnerability to heat waves in a mind map. Thinking about everything we've encompassed throughout the day. This is what a group of researchers had put together for their idea of a, of a vulnerability to heat mind map. And you're going to notice it's going to be pretty different. But <laughs> let's talk about it. Yep. No, that's good. Don't laugh. She waited to embarrass us. I know. Yeah. I was not trying to. Yeah. Okay. Who wants? To, yeah, a group of researchers. Who, who knows what they were doing? Um, <laughs> let's. Who wants to start? I'll start. Why not? Okay. Um, so ours is over here. It's it's yeah. the kindergarten group. Um, <laughs> so our idea was like nearly everything's connected. I think that that shows that. That's going to be a running theme as um, we know. Yeah. But we kind of grouped it into four separate <laughs> groups, so to speak. So we've got um, the environmental, the social, the economic, and the health. And as you can see, there's just stuff connecting everywhere. But 
There's a lot of crossover. I mean, wildfires obviously they affect not only health, environmental, but we couldn't really draw it. But I mean, it affects the ec economics and social. Socioeconomics of everything. So David, there's nobody online anymore. We don't have oh, to. oh, okay, great. Well, good. I don't have to yell. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> poor people were like, yeah. <laughs> I know. So a lot of it has to do with you know water scarcity causes other issues that cascade across other groups. So there's not really any one vulnerability. Everything's vulnerable. I think is ultimately kind of what we're looking at. Um, so I don't know what else to say about that. No, I think that's a good point. We're going to yeah. circle back to that idea yeah. of levels of vulnerability here in a second. Yeah. All right, our other two groups. Who wants to go? OK, I'm just going to pick you guys. Go. Who wants to talk for your group? You're done. You're doing a great job. <laughs> it, looks, it looks great. It does. So basically, ours is just, it's the same concept that everything is connected. So because you're vulnerable in one area, you're probably vulnerable in many other areas. And all of the different types of vulnerability kind of go into different categories and they all link together. So we kind of break those up into demographics and health, economics, um, communications, and environmental, which I've got a job box around at the bottom. Um, and then you'll see that in your demographics part, like you've got your age and your location, your education, your language barriers. Not only are they demographic vulnerabilities, but they're also communication vulnerabilities. Absolutely. And then you've got your, everything kind of connects back to your economics, and then your environmental also connects back to your economics, and then you've got different things like your reduced productivity, which can lead to a decrease in mental health, because if you're not out doing your job and making money, and you sit at home, you can get depressed, and that affects your health factors. Um, you can have different <coughs> conditions, or even conditions that develop as a result of having a heat wave. So maybe you didn't have a health condition before, but now that you are subjected to a heat wave, you are developing this condition that you didn't have before. And also looking at the type of lifestyle that you lived before can affect how vulnerable you are when something like that happens. But basically just how everything connects together was the biggest thing that we had. So you do have a few key points in here that we hadn't talked about yet, which are, that's great to add to the conversation. The language barriers we hadn't talked. The preconditioning, preconditioning, pre-existing conditions were somewhat mentioned earlier, but you know, those were, those are big, especially asthma, blood pressure, we mentioned pregnancy. Um, and then this accessibility issue, that, that's one that's kind of a whole new area for what we talked about today. This is, this is, these are great. Okay, our last group. What she said. <laughs> what she said. There we go. So I do think, unless you guys want to expand. I, I mean, Greg, you start to say something. I'm sorry. Oh, the only thing I was going to say, the only approach we did differently is we looked at everything with respect to the vulnerability of the general populace. But it's not just the populace that's, in, that's affected by this. You have, you know, geography that's <laughs> affected by this. You know. Um, uh, the, the land as a whole, so uh, which all of those are also linked to it, but you know we didn't go down that road, but right. thank goodness. So it leads me to one question when we're thinking about developing this idea of seasonal forecasts and vulnerability and what it involves and how interconnected it is. Actually, it's going to be two questions a little bit. Do you think there's sufficient data on these on these seven things? And do you think that when you're communicating to your groups, we have a bunch of different you know, utility groups, National Weather Service, forecasters, do you consider what it, do you consider how many of these aspects or what proportion of these mind maps do you guys consider when you're communicating with the public? So any thoughts on those? how it's been done or is it just because there's so much to talk about that maybe it's 
Okay. I think I would just say it. Anything, anybody else want to chime in on that? So personally, I think I, what I was hoping we'd get from this, we did, is this idea it's all interconnected. We are trying to look to develop not only these seasonal forecasts, but these, these uh, vulnerability metrics. And we could, it, it, if we went by this picture, right, everybody would have the same level of vulnerability. We would all be extremely or not extremely vulnerable to, to different types of heat. And if we look at the, the other mind map that was up there that was done by a group at the University of Delaware, they encapsulate the exact same things that you guys have on here. They talk about sensitivity, sensitivity of different populations, and then exposure. And they break off in the exact same ways that you guys have uh, pulled your different variables. Yes, they all highlight different instances, but it's all highlighting how interconnected this idea of understanding heat is. And really kind of how far we still have to go to truly be able to, you know, to, to show this um, in a meaningful way. And so one, I, some ideas that we have, I mean, we've been doing this by regions. David showed you some of the regions earlier. And in that first phase analysis I mentioned to you guys before, where we looked at the number of patches and the size of those patches that happened, we did this not only at the uh, country level, but we also did this by regions as well to see how to start to break down some of this idea about different populations, different land cover types, different levels of vulnerability, what they're experiencing to start to get this idea of, of, of differential vulnerability across the country. But by no means are we there yet with it. It's just it's another way for us to start to break down um, the data that we have, and these are very helpful for doing that. All right, so this one is not a question you need to write down um, and everything, but and this is a rather quick, and this is our last question of the day, um, and then we have one little, like, two-second wrap-up. But one of the things we've been talking about a lot is it's really easy to have a memory of hurricanes, tornadoes, extreme rainfall events, floods, things that impact, say, infrastructure, transportation. But to us, when we look through the literature, when we talk to people, the idea of memory of heat waves and their impact seems to be a lot shorter. So really quickly, just raise your hand. Is that, do you think that's true? Is a heat wave memory shorter? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? Yeah. 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 Okay. Because Almost. I yeah. would say because they're, like the heat waves, you think, don't think of it like for the tornadoes, the hurricanes, <coughs> just Google it. The, you, people always bring up the pictures, the pictures of the devastation, the yes. destruction. Mm -hmm. Whenever like the next new event is coming, oh, you remember Katrina? Do you remember this? Do you remember? And then they're showing the pictures because they are s proof, visual proof. Visual proof, absolutely. And you don't have that for heat waves. That's true. I mean, we do. Uh, we could. We should be better. Mm -hmm. Maybe in getting those because there are. We could show crop die off. We could. I mean, maybe it's not as. People sexy, so to speak, as you know, as the bleeding. Yeah. 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 I think part of that problem is because you got the media that goes to the well, I'm going to yes. go fry an egg on, a, mm -hmm. on the top of a hood of a car, <coughs> and it sort of makes light of the issue Absolutely. to some extent. I mean, you know, it, yeah, it's hot enough to cook an egg. I think people's recollection to the kind of subjectively experiential. So if you're a roofer, for instance, mm -hmm. And you have a severe episode of some type of heat sickness. You know, you might be one hospitalized. You're going to remember that forever, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in agriculture and you have a significant crop loss because mm -hmm. of an event that has a financial impact or whatever, then you're going to remember that. But if you're just experiencing it walking to and from your vehicle or your office, then you know what's the trigger there? So exactly. I think for each individual person, how they experience that and what the impacts and consequences are. Memory of it. And it's the, to the point of the visual stimulus, you know, that you have to experience it. The thing about an image is that you visually experience that episode. Right? You don't have that with heat unless you have something else there to trigger it. So do you think then, just kind of feeding off that, one of the big things that came to my mind was the, the World Cup from last summer and when it, it was ex extreme heat. Obviously with the women doing well in the U U.S., it was maybe more attention to it than normally what do, you, do we think that raised awareness at all, or does it need to be much more frequent, unfortunately, and scope to like drastically raise the awareness? Yeah. 
So, um, Chandra, I think will back me up on this, right? That what we know um, in communication is that repetition of message is essential. Yes. Nobody remembers anything the first, second, third, fourth, yeah. fifth time they hear it. Yeah. Right? So we're north of that in terms of repetition. It's one of the reasons advertising is organized the way it is. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that strikes me there is when we go back to the idea of a visual cue or, or memory cue or trigger in some ways that, you know, um, the other, several other forms of hazardous weather have visual, and Jake I think can relate to this, visual representations in different ways that stick in people's minds as a kind of a warning indicator or a reason to become alert when I'm hearing the weather forecast. <clears throat> but we don't have a visualization, an iconic visualization, right? An icon that represents heat waves, right? In particular, heat as a, as a, as a form of danger. Um, and so I would think that as a communication person, I would say that we need to think about systematic campaigns, communication campaigns, and we need to create some kind of iconic representation that can be placed in the minds like the Nike swoosh. That was a, that, that was a 10 year campaign that created the swoosh such that no words are needed anymore for us to read that as just do it and Nike in our own heads, right? So just to give you a you know, kind of example of how that works in terms of embedding things in people's minds. That's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Well, I think just to <clears throat> piggyback on that is with these other big events that they usually have a, you know, a hurricane makes a landfall or a tornado touches down. Mm -hmm. With a heat wave, um, and I guess you know, related to that would be a drought, you don't really know that you're in the midst of it until you're really well, in the midst of it. So um, I think that's important to, to understand. You know, the other challenge I think is how do you get somebody who is accustomed to living in a, in a warm climate to take heat seriously when they, they feel like they have always experienced it. And even if it's <coughs> you know, not 20 degrees hotter than, than it was, they're not gonna experience something of that magnitude, but maybe the duration is different, or maybe, you know, the, the land cover around them has changed and that really affects, you know, how do you communicate that part? Because it's, it's, it's their so own vulnerability more. has changed, but they'd right. be unaware of they, it yeah. until yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's right. so much more than just <coughs> putting out a, a number. You know, a heat yeah. wave is not a number. Yeah. Um, and so how do you, I just think about, how do you communicate that? It's not like a category system, but that's necessarily a real public based kind of category system. No, I mean, there's a lot, like obviously we've talked about hurricanes, there's even like what pollen level classifications, there's all these right. ways yeah. when we're talking about certain climate, you know, climate variables that we can say, but there's not one, to, like there's like no definition of heat, no right. classification, because in some ways it's it's subjective to, you know, to each person, to your age, your your health. You know, there's it's a lot of compounding variables. Well, it kind of goes back to what Susan said. Like I just we had a Google trainer in yesterday, and so we did a lot of images and thinking about what comes to mind. And when you Google heat wave, the consistent things on here are the sun and the intensity of the yellow colors, oh. and then also a thermometer and what level the thermometer is at, and it's around 95 and 100. And so that's the only things I see consistent is the color like of the visuals. And so like that may be part of the key is getting that visual in people's heads. Yeah. Because yeah. we are a very visual society. Yep. Absolutely. That iconic representation, but the trouble with the yellow and the sun will be we also have a positive association with that, right? A nice yes. sunny, love this nice sunny yes. day. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, then humans so react a lot to fear. Mm -hmm. So you will remember a lot more fear, a lot fear more. Afraid. You know, like let's say last summer, you remember the three times where, oh my God, the tornado hit you versus the 50 days of happiness you had because our brain is conditioned to remember more the fear and the fear responses to like events. So, no, that's a great point. People are always going to remember something that has impacted them personally. Yes. Can I say something too about the yeah. rating uh, scale thing? So, if you think about a hurricane, for instance, you have your Saffir Simpson scale. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily representative of the impacts, mm -hmm. right? So you can have a very, very large wind field, a very small wind field. Yeah, you, know, you may have a lot of surge, or yeah. there may be nobody that lives yeah, right, that's particularly true. Right here. That's true. So for a hurricane type, as an example, I think we would experience that as something happening to us, right? Like there's a threat there. For a heat wave, it's pretty much invisible. 
so if you think about it just kind of floating out over an area of a map where nobody lives, how do you communicate to somebody, don't go there, you know, if it's a level three or whatever risk, um, but it's not necessarily something that's coming to get them, you know, but it's yeah. a threat that it's just kind of implicit there. I mean, and I think this is a very right extreme on. example about what I'm going to say, but if you tell somebody that there's a category two hurricane coming, or it's going to be a week and a half of 100 degree weather with 100% humidity, what are they going to be more worried about? They're probably going to be more worried about the hurricane side of things, whereas, I mean, we can think about dehydration. And how, I mean, there's so much else that goes into it. That's a very extreme example, of course. But that, that, that gets back to, I don't know what to call it, geographic cultural sensitivity or whatever. If I'm in Michigan, I'm not worried about a hurricane. No, that's absolutely true. But if I'm in Michigan, I'm worried about polar vortexes. But I mean, but if you're in Michigan and you start talking about you're going to have a week of 100 degree temperature, that's a significant event. And now, if you're in Alabama and you start talking about we are going to have long track, long term, deadly tornadoes, and I have a weather briefing, I'm sorry, guys, I might get five people in the room to listen to the weather briefing. <laughs> you flip that coin over, I'm going to have three flakes of snow fall in the next <laughs> <laughs> you, You've got standing room only. Yeah. Now, I have struggled with this for years. This will kill you. Yeah. And I cannot get your attention. This is a minor inconvenience, and all you want to do <laughs> is go to the store and buy milk and bread. Yeah. I, I, it's the novelty. It's, it's, it's so, I mean, you, you try to say, well, how do I how do I message that? How do I get that across that I'm telling people this is a threat? This will kill you. Will, yeah. People don't want to come out and say things like that. No. Yeah. You don't want to get on the news media and say, we are going to have a heat wave that's going to be 10 days long. It's going to be 100 degrees plus. People are going to die. No. But that's what the message what needs, needs to be. be. I agree with that. Um, sort of kind of in line with what he was just saying is, and I think you know this may be more of a question for y'all as y'all continue this project, is you know what should the response to a heat wave be? Because you know we always talk about the basic things that you can do, but if we're starting to talk about things that may be lasting longer over a larger area, how sustainable are those standard safety recommendations for being in a heat wave? You know, I mean, if we talk about with a hurricane, you know, have this many weeks worth of, of water or medicine or, or whatever, you know, should we be treating heat waves similarly? Are people going to need to be stationary for a long period of time? You know, it's not like a hurricane where you can evacuate. Um, you know, I don't think the response would be to evacuate out of a heat wave area. No. So I, I would just think about, you know, what are some response types, type things that may not already uh, be done? How is that going to change given how the heat waves themselves are changing. Well, I think that question of what should the response be and also the outlet, like, because we don't just want this to be in an academic journal that eight people are going to ever read and download. So uh, the idea of these workshops is to say, what, you know, what are the variables impacted? What could be the potential vulnerability? Or what are the items needed to help answer some of these questions? what would be the outlets once you understand that and then what could be some say responses or some more you know relationship to understand the responses that could be suggested well the, the other interesting thing is is that and this is exactly what I think you were talking about is from a forecasting standpoint it always seems like people are very cautious about forecasting extreme temperatures you know if you see uh, the moss guidance forecasting a record high well I don't know about forecasting a record high, but if that's what's becoming more likely, you know, you really need to set it out exactly, you know, what, what might be coming, even if it's something that somebody's never experienced before. Well, I, just kind of piggybacking off of what uh, Dr. Jessica said, I, I think education from a younger age could help. So um, you see a lot of people, at least I see a lot more people talking about tornadoes now than maybe I did. 10 years ago because of social media mm -hmm. and people grew up in an environment where talking about it, you know, we have James Fan around here, people know who he is, you know, so people are more aware of those things from a younger age. They know the things that they're supposed to do. It didn't start here. It started 10, 20 10 years, years ago. ago. Yep. 
So I'm wondering if maybe we could do some better job of just educating people. Mm -hmm. What are the symptoms of being, you know, too hot? You know, how do you handle these things? And I, and I see some of that now, but I, I'm, I think we're trying to find an immediate answer, and I think it's probably more than likely a long-term answer yeah, to this I, question. I, I, yeah, it's yeah. The, the slow play, right, to make yeah. sure to raise awareness over time. I, yeah. I can see that. And so, I mean, going along with, you know, we have UV indexes and things of that nature, we could do something similar with heat waves, like, well, they you, you know, and, and, and as far as iconography is concerned, you know, that could help. Okay, so we are at 2 o'clock. David and I will stick around for a little bit if you have any questions for us or you want to follow up. We really appreciate you being here today, and this is valuable for what we're planning to do. Um, if I do have some cards in the front, if anybody would like to take one, feel free to reach out. If you either have any other feedback or ideas, uh, we're open to hearing it. And um, drive safely home for those who are traveling farther. We appreciate you coming over. About what's coming. So um, there's a survey that we want you guys to do. So we're going to send you the link to that survey because I know you guys want to get out of here and get on, on to the rest of your day. So we'll send the link to the survey. That's going to capture more of this information. It's also kind of the after action from this workshop. So based on what you did here, you'll be answering the survey. We're going to add that data to all the data that we got from today, providing it to these folks to continue on with their work. We're going to have another workshop sometime in late October. We'll invite you guys back if you can come. If you can't come, we'll webinar you in. Ultimately, there's a report that you're going to get back from all of this with all of this information. And it's tailored to your use. It's customized to your use based on what you've provided today. So if you think of more things, please communicate with the researchers, communicate with us. We'll pass it on to them as you think of more of this stuff. Because this is really important to it. Like I said at the beginning, this isn't worth anything unless it means something to the people who are going to use it. And so your input is very, very valuable to all of this. So we really appreciate your participation. I know it was a hard effort to get here given all the rain and work and everything that you guys do. So we really do appreciate y'all's participation. Thank y'all for coming.